dear speakers to them. So uh, we shall listen to each other of us then. And then uh, without wasting so much time, I will call uh, Dr. Anes Noelazen, uh, who should be getting ready to come and tell us this whole thing, what is data science Africa? What is data? Why is it even important for us? And uh, for us, it's important that we are posting it in the East and, um, and we are having all the Eastern universities majorly here. I'm also from Kampala, Tangobo, Makerere, Mbarara. How many are from Kavale today, sorry? Kavale, Mbarara. Uh, yes, we have one person. Tangobo, we have so many of them. Thank you for coming. Makerere. Yes, thank you. And uh, Muni University, Great Soroti, uh, led by Professor Tushare Florence. Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, so, without wasting so much time, I will invite uh, Dr. Anes Mueva to give us a whole, a little bit overview of data science Africa before we get started to the program. Thank you so much. Africa, so Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, then we do a bit of West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, I want to do Senegal, um, yeah, so we've, we've been doing East and West, East and West. So the idea of Data Science Africa is to create a, a group of people, a group of people who are interested in data science. And the idea is this thing called end-to-end -end data science, right? So you want to start with a good problem and come up to a solution, a data science solution, a machine learning solution um, that solves the problem, right? So end-to-end -end means you start with the data collection, the problem, you go through the data, you, you sort of process the data, build the algorithms, deploy them, maintain them, uh, and sort of that whole pipeline. And if you look at the way we've structured the, the, the summer school, so this day of, of tutorials, it sort of follows a similar, similar order, right? Start with a bit of learning of the language, then you go into a bit of machine learning, understand some problems, then you start specializing, computer vision, NLP, um, and then at the end, you look at some case studies. And also tomorrow, we'll have some of the students presenting the work they're doing in this field. Um, so, that's the idea of data science, to build a community, to build a network of people interested in data science, but particularly interested in solving the problems that are here, that are contextual. So that's a big picture. Now, the, the other big picture of data science, Africa and the Eastern region, this one, is you want to the idea of, of addressing problems that are contextual to your environment is important. And so we want to also do data science in the different regions of the country because we believe the different regions have different unique problems, right? They have different unique challenges. Uh, they have different people working on the problems here. And uh, 
the group here led by uh, Dr. Godliver has been doing so much work and uh, we thought this would be a good opportunity to come here, gather the people from the different universities in the East and have a really good session here. Right? So this is uh, the first of its kind in Uganda, part of Data Science Africa Uganda chapter. So at the end of this workshop, we are hoping there will be some... Uh, some elections, some voting for where we put the next. Are we going to Mbarara? Are we going to, um, to the north? Are we going to the west? Are we going to Chambogo? Are we going to Makere? Uh, so yeah, so those who are interested, you should start uh, either passing around brown envelopes, you know. You know there, there's many ways you can lobby to, to get the next uh, Data Science Africa, Uganda chapter launch or uh, session, workshop. Okay, so the, how, how, how does it work? So we have today, today is a day of uh, summer school, we call it a summer school. Uh, so mainly this one focuses on tutorials, uh, mainly targets the students who are here. Um, the ones here, the ones online, and basically, it's, it's an opportunity to sort of um, engage on some of the topics, bring people up to speed, have people play around with the technology, with a couple of problems. Uh, ideally, this should have been three days, um, but we, we, we are sort of constrained. And then tomorrow is a slightly different flavor. So tomorrow is a workshop. It's a workshop day. We ideally, we are presenting work from people who have been doing some work and showcasing what they've been doing. And also, talking about problems that are affecting us, how do we continue doing good teaching in data science? Um, what are the sort of the problems we should be addressing? These kind of things. Uh, so that's the structure of these, uh, these two days. Okay, so I'll, uh, these remarks were on behalf of Martin. So if I've made any mistakes, it's Martin. If there are good things, that's on me. Uh, but thank you very much. I'd like to also welcome you here and uh, yeah, let's enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, for the quick overview for today's uh, workshop. So, uh, we may need permission from our dean. <laughs> Otherwise, he may tell us if people first hold on. Yeah, so I will call upon the dean, faculty of engineering, uh, Dr. Otim Daniel, to give us welcome remarks uh, from Busitema University and also to allow us to be here <laughs> officially. Thank you. Well, our distinguished guests from Data Science uh, Africa, Uganda, uh, you're most welcome uh, to Wistema University and specifically the Faculty of Engineering and Technology, which is housing, or which will be hosting this today event of the Data Science uh, Africa, Uganda, Eastern Chapter. Uh, of course, it would be a disservice not to let you know what Wustema University is all about uh, before, in, in my opening remarks. Well, Wustema University started in 2007 as a university that used to be an agricultural college, but since 2007, that's when uh, we became a university through an act of parliament, and we do have six campuses, uh, so where we are seated is the main campus and it houses the faculty of engineering and technology. We have another campus in Tororo, which houses the faculty of science and education, specifically in Nagongera. Then we have the faculty of health sciences in Mbale. Uh, then we have the faculty of agriculture and animal sciences in Soroti, specifically in Arapai. 
Then we have the Faculty of Management Sciences in Palisa. And finally, uh, we have the Faculty of Natural Resources, which is located in Namasagali in Kamuli District. So that is, uh, those are the districts where Usema University have the footprint. So don't feel, uh, don't be surprised as you drive back and you reach Jinja and you see a signpost of Usema University somewhere. Yes, we have a campus that. Uh, 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 in Kamuli, but uh, the signpost is somewhere in Jinja, similarly when you're in Bale, Palisa, and the like. Uh, so that is all about Ustema University that I thought I should share with the members here. And uh, uh, like I mentioned, you're most welcome to the main campus, and specifically the Faculty of Engineering and Technology, which will be hosting this two-day event whose theme is improving livelihoods through data science and interdisciplinary research. Uh, let us uh, take advantage of the guest speakers who would be sharing with us a vast amount of knowledge. Uh, I, for one, I wouldn't claim to be a data science, but I use lots of data, so I don't know if that will qualify me to be a data science, but I know that whatever we are doing here is to improve livelihoods uh, in the different communities and that is what data science is also all about. You come up with applications uh, or solutions that will enable one to improve livelihoods. So I want to believe irrespective of one's background, uh, data science is a core in everything that you do. Without data science, all these other professions wouldn't have anything they wouldn't be, they wouldn't exist. So I'm here to learn and I'm really thrilled and I call upon everyone to really uh, ensure that they learn as much as possible. A big thank you to the organizers and to the guest speakers. I know you have hectic schedules, but you took time to travel to Stema University to come and make this function a success. Like I've always mentioned for us, we only availed the venue but there's a lot that happened in the background. And since I won't have an opportunity to speak again, it's only prudent that I say a big thank you to all the organizers of this event because it is also putting Busitema on the global map. Of course, we're already there, but it's, also, it's consolidating our position there. So feel free. I don't know if you've been, if you, if you are, you've taken a tour around the building but I thought for the presses of convenience uh, on any of these floors, now that you're on the ground floor, if you want to access the washrooms, and you go to the extreme ends of the block on this other side to the left and to the right. So once you move, then you will turn if, uh, if you, on this extreme end. So once you reach the extreme end, on this other side, you turn on the right hand side. On my left hand side, you turn on the right hand side. And on my right hand side, you turn on the left hand side, that's where the washrooms are. And they are on all the floors. So if maybe you want to take a, a stroll and go to the first floor, and you can go and you access the washrooms from there as well. So I thought it necessary uh, to let us uh, know where these facilities are located. Uh, so that when nature calls, you know where to go to. So that said, once again, you're most welcome. And it is my prayer and hope that you enjoy your stay in Bustema University and Tororo. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to learning. Thank you very much, Dean, for these opening remarks and for allowing us to learn from here. Uh, next, we are going to have uh, Mr. Chisitu. Mr. Chisitu is a, a student of computer engineering here at Busitema University. He is very enthusiastic uh, about data science. He is going to take us through Python programming for data science. Please, let's welcome Mr. Chisitu.
Richard, wherever you are, first come and Uh, that is now uh, that quiet. is now you're working with uh, databases, you're working with Excel or you're working with comma-separated values. Then math plot lib, uh, it's basically for visualization. If you're coming up with plots, that, that could be line plots, uh, it could be bar plots, any kind of plots you're coming up with. Then circuit learn, for it, it is a machine learning library. Uh, it provides very many models you can use and many pre-processing modules, as we shall see. So from this session, expect we are going to do some kind of importation. We shall do cleaning and manipulation of data. And the due process, expect to do some description, normalization, and encoding of categoricals. We shall get to know all those terms in the due process. Then we shall do some kind of visualization and do some simple case study. So just like any other language, still for Python, we need, we need a programming environment or some kind of development environment. So in most cases, we use cases, we cases, we cases, we cases. Okay. So in most cases, we use uh, Jupyter Notebook. So we can, you can always run that command in your command line. If you want to install Jupyter Notebooks, uh, this command here. Uh, but for this case, we shall be using Google Colab. Um, it's an online platform. It allows you to use the very interface of, Google, of Jupyter Notebooks, this very interface you're seeing here. So let's get started. So I've explained to you up there the four libraries you are going to use. So how do you load those libraries to, do, to start doing your machine learning tasks and whatever you want to do? So for those who are going to use local environments, just in case you, you have installed uh, Jupyter Lab, eh? you can always, you can always run, that, run that, that this installer, installer, that command there, pip install, numpy pandas, mathplotlib, and circuit line to always install those libraries for you locally, to use them locally, if you're not using Google Colab. But in case you're using Google Colab, these libraries are actually provided for you. So starting from there, proceeding, I presume everybody has installed these libraries, even in case you're using a local environment, okay? So how do you import these libraries? So importing, we use always the keyword, import, 
then the name of the library, then the alias or the short form you want to use has NP. So NP is a short form for NumPy. So if in case you want to access any access function in NumPy, NumPy instead of writing NumPy dot NumPy. that function, we just write NP dot that function. Our fellows are the best. Can you view these things clearly right now? I reduce. I reduce. I reduce. I increase. I reduce. I increase. Better. The lighting. Yeah? Lighting. Yeah? Better. Is it okay? Is it okay? Is it okay? It's okay. It's okay. I guess that's a bit clear. So those, these are the libraries that try to explain you how to impose them. That's now the panels um, as well as So data scientists, of course, you're working with data scientists. That is locally provided in some kind of library. For example, let's look at this. So we are trying to import uh, the Irish data set. Uh, this is provided in the circuit LAN library. So in most cases, uh, we have the load data set function that we can actually use to load the data set. I'm meaning this function here, load data set. So underscore data set, this one, you substitute it with the name of the data set you want to load. So for this case, you want to uh, increase it. Yeah. It's okay? Clear? Still the same. I think you can put it back to light more. Okay, so we are trying to look at the first case scenario when you're loading data from some kind of library. I've told you we always use the load underscore data set. And this one, data set, we normally replace it with the name of the data set you want to load. For this case, we are trying to load the Irish data set. So this function is provided in the data sets module. So from circuitland.datasets, we are accessing that module, we import the load underscore Irish. Why Irish? Because we want to load the Irish data set. So if you want to load Boston, then it will be load underscore Boston. If you want to load wine, then it will be load underscore wine. If you want to load California, then it will be load underscore California. You get the logic. So we are loading our data set from here. And if you try to note, we are passing a parameter has frame. So has frame what it does, what you, what's going to be returned from this function is actually going to be a dictionary. So the dictionary will contain the data that you're going to use to train your model. It will contain the target, the values that you're trying to predict, and also it will contain the description of that data if in case you want to read it. So 
uh, what's returned here is that this dictionary I've been trying to explain. It has the data, it has the target, and also it has the description of, of that data. So if in case you want to uh, construct a data frame, uh, a data frame is just a table, it's some kind of table. It's a data structure provided in Pandas. How you construct it is, I've told you that data is the data sets you want to use to train your model. Then target are those values you're trying to predict. So I'm creating a new data frame, and from Irish, I'm pulling out that data. You get it? I'm pulling out that data. Then I've created a new column, and in that new column, I'm pulling the target from the Irish. You get it? So if you try to uh, visualize the head of your data, so data.head, the head function, what it helps you to do, it's going to print for you the topmost values of that data set. Okay? The topmost values. So if you want to see the bottom values, you can always use data.tail. .tail will always produce the, produce the last values. Then .head will always produce the first values. So this is how our Irish data looks like. So from separal lengths to petro width, that's our data. Then the values we're trying to predict are the target. So an intuition of this data, it was actually designed in such a way that they wanted to, to input the matrix uh, of a flower in a model. That is its separal length with this, uh, the petal length and with this into some model. And that model was supposed to predict the species of that flower. So the species are actually encoded uh, zero. Uh, one and two. Those are three species. As uh, zero uh, is repres uh, representing the Irish setosa. That was the first species. Then the one uh, one represents another species. That is the Irish vasicola. And then the last uh, two was representing in this target. It was representing Irish virginica. That was the other species. So the other data was supposed to predict uh, the target. Okay, the species. So you can always use uh, some other function provided in Pandas to study your data. So data.shape tells you how many rows and columns you're having in that data frame. So for this case, for the Irish data set, we have 150 rows, okay? And five columns, okay? So data.dtypes, that's also another function. .dtypes is another function. So what it tries to tell you, it tells you uh, it lists all the columns. In this context, we call them futures, okay? But uh, I'm using columns to just make it simpler. So this, these are our futures, or these are our columns. So you get to know what's the data type for each corresponding column. So here you know that all of them are floats with the exception of the target that is an integer. So you can still access some more function like is null.sum. Is null, this first section, what it helps you to tell, it returns a boolean, a true or false, that uh, is null. It's either going to return that there are null values in your data set. Null values are like missing values. Of course, the data you're working with will not be perfectly clean. Okay? Sometimes you'll have missing values. Sometimes you have categorical values, as we shall learn. So is null dot sum returns for you the total number of missing values. So in this context, what you can realize that we have no missing values in the separate length, neither do we with this length and uh, the petal with this. So it means to some extent this data is clean, okay? Then if you want to get statistics about your data, just getting to know something about uh, that data, you can always use the dot describe function. So the dot describe function, what it returns, it's going to return those statistical parameters. The count, count uh, represents the total number of uh, entries in a given column. So here we have 150 in the separate length. Then the mean, you can also get the mean, the standard deviation, uh, the minimum and the maximum value, 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles of your data set, okay? So we're just looking at the first case scenario. We are actually working with data that's locally provided in some kind of library. But that's not always going to be the case. Maybe you're trying to 
work on some data you've collected maybe from some kind of survey, okay? So that means for that case scenario, you're going to import some external data. So how do we do that? So the pandas, uh, you remember the short form for pandas, we said we're importing pandas as PD. So in pandas, we are accessing some function called the read underscore CSV. So this function, it's read underscore type of file you're trying to import. So for this case, the file I imported here was a comma separated file, CSV. That's why I use the read underscore CSV. But if in case you're reading an Excel file, then it should be read underscore Excel XX, right? The extension for Excel. So uh, the parameter you pass here is always the directory to where you store that external file, okay? So for this case, this is the directory. So I'm reading a CSV file, and in my curry brackets, I'm providing the directory where that file is actually stored, okay? So, uh, we have loaded that data, that's the housing data set. So, if you try to look at this data, uh, these are our features, uh, the rooms, distance, bedroom, and wherever, the other side. So, the purpose of this data set was to use uh, these features, that's the rooms, the number of rooms, distance, bedroom, uh, the land size, bathroom, latitude, longitude, and region, uh, to actually predict uh, the price of that house, okay? It was more of a real estate data set. But what I want you to study about this data set is, I don't know whether it is uh, visible very well to members behind there. I want you to note something about this data set in comparison to the recent one that this data set has missing values, okay? N-A-N, N-A-N, uh, that represents missing values. And also the other thing is uh, we have categoricals. So categoricals are actually words, okay? In your data set you're having maybe some column with words, okay? But in most cases the models you're going to come up with, they don't accept words, okay? They don't accept categoricals. So we, ha we have to look at a certain way. We have to encode this. And at the very time, we have to look at a way we are supposed to handle the missing values in this data set to train maybe a sensible model. OK? So this takes us to the new session. Uh, and that session is uh, data preprocessing. Are we together? Are we together? Okay, that's very good. So data preprocessing. So our aim here, we are going to do uh, various preprocessing uh, to this data set. It will be in a series. So the first thing we are going to do, we are going to first check for the missing values, okay? So we are still using the other function, is null.sum. So note, note for this case that rooms has no missing value, right? But check for the column for distance, it has one missing value, right? Bedrooms has 18,217 missing values. And it gets worse if you get to the land size, okay? That's 11,810 missing values. So such kind of data, if you try to feed it to your model, uh, it's actually going to affect the kind of accuracy you're going to get from that model, okay? So we need to pre-process this data. So how do we handle missing values? There are different strategies you can use to handle missing values. And one of them, we can just simply eliminate rows with missing values, okay? We just eliminate them from our data set. But think about it, if you're eliminating rows, how many rows are you going to eliminate? A lot, isn't it? That means you're going to lose a great proportion of your data set. So the other 
strategy we use is always mean substitution. Uh, what mean substitution does is we are going to compute the mean for each specific column. Maybe the mean for this column distance. Then every missing value in that column, we shall replace it with the calculated mean. Okay? That's one strategy. Then the other thing, we can use the mod, mod substitution. Uh, we, def we determine the mod for that column, then we replace it with all the missing values. Then the other strategy could be the median. You can determine the median for that specific column and always replace the median uh, with the missing values in that column. Okay? So how do we implement this? Of course, as I told you at the beginning, scikit-learn has a lot of pre-processing functions we can always use. So uh, one of them have the simple imputer class, uh, and that is provided in, in the input uh, processing module in scikit-learn. This is how we import it, okay? Uh, from scikit-learn in the impute module, uh, we import our simple imputer class. So when you are creating its object, you realize that we are passing the strategy here. This is where you define the kind of strategy you want to use to handle your missing values. So if you're using min, of course, uh, you, you provide your min. If you're going to use the mod, then this won't be min, it will be mod, right? Then if you're going to use median, then you replace this with median, okay? Then the other thing is you have to specify which rows you want to handle, okay? Where am I saying you have to specify? If you come back here, region, has, region name has words, right? Right? If you go back to the other previous data set, I try to see that the column for region name has words. And you cannot compute the mean, neither can you compute the median uh, or mode of words, right? So you, you need to select, uh, literally you have to select the columns you want to work with. So for this case, I've selected uh, rooms, distance, bedrooms, land size, bathroom, uh, latitude, longitude, and the price, because those are the only numeric columns you have in this data set. So after creating your object and passing in your strategy you're going to use, you've specified your columns, then you have to fit your object on your data. The purpose of fitting is um, here, the imputer.fit housing, then we're trying to reference those uh, columns that we have selected, okay? The purpose of the fit function is that it's going to go to each column and calculate the mean for those corresponding columns, right? Remember, we are working with over six columns, so it will go and compute the mean for those respective six columns. Then here, the imputer.transform, the transform function, what it's going to do, it's going to go in those specific columns, look out for missing values, and replace them with the calculated means for those respective columns. Okay? You get it? Okay. So we are assigning, in our data set, uh, we are assigning the other columns a data that we have already transformed. Okay? that you have cleaned of those missing values. So if you try to check again for missing values in your data set, you find that uh, rooms, distance, uh, wherever, uh, they have no missing values, except the region name that we excluded, right? Because it had words. You get it? Are we together? Okay, that's very good. So of course that takes us to the next step. How do you handle words or categoricals? Because I already told you, uh, the models you're going to design actually don't accept words as input. So what we are going to do, we are going to encode them. So how do you encode? So suppose you are working with a, a data set that is actually taking details of um, members of the East African community, right? Uh, let me take a case of only Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. So if you have such a data set, we are going to uh, choose a strategy we are going to use to encode, okay? So we can always say, uh, a person from Uganda, we shall substitute zero for Uganda, okay? So wherever you say zero in your data set, you know that's Uganda, right? So one for Kenya. So wherever you see one in your data set, you know that person is from Kenya, okay? 
then two for Tanzania. So wherever you always see a two, you know, yeah, that person is from TZ. Okay? So how do we implement that? Of course, we have the ideology of how we want to handle it, but how do we implement it? So we always use the label encoder class to do that. Still, it is provided in the pre-processing module in the circuit LAN library. So always the first step is to import the class you want to work with. So from circuit line, we are trying to access the pre-processing module and we are importing the label encoder. So the label encoder, what it's going to do, uh, it's going to assign each specific region a specific number, okay? Zero maybe for Uganda, one for Kenya, and two for Tanzania. Because if you try to go back to a data set, you find that the regions we have, and uh, the regions we have, we have no Northern Metropolitan, uh, if you try to look at the extreme end, we have Western Metropolitan, and the middle of the data set, maybe you could have Eastern Metropolitan, and so many other places that we can't visualize here. Okay? So, how do you use the label encoder? So, the label encoder, also you have to first create its object, just the way we did it for the simple imputer. So, this is just a variable uh, that will store your object that you've created. So uh, you've created your object here. So what you're going to do, uh, this one I just created a copy. Uh, I will, shall use it in future there. So you're going to select which column, which specific future do you want to encode, okay? Of course you want to encode that column with words and that's the region name, okay? That column for region name. That's why the label encoder.fit transform, uh, it's being fitted on the region name, okay? So let's try to look at its effect if you run that cell. So if you try to, uh, to see what has happened here, you see uh, a 222666 at the end. So what it tells you is that now, in the previous data set, we had uh, Northern Metropolitan. So Northern Metropolitan has been encoded with a two, okay? Then Western, uh, the other one was Western Metropolitan. It has been encoded with a six. And maybe in the middle of the data set, we have something maybe like Southern Metropolitan. Maybe it is encoded by a four, with a four, okay? It could be any number, okay? So uh, that's one of the strategies you use to always encode categoricals if you have them in your data set. However, this has a drawback. And one of the drawbacks is, I suppose we assign Uganda 0, 1, and a 2. And if you go back to your elemental math and you look at 2 and the 1, of course a 2 is greater than 1, right? So in some sense you might think maybe Tanzania is better than Uganda, right? So uh, that's one of the drawbacks of the label encoder. When you're coming up with your model, your model might uh, try to figure it in some way of a hierarchical order that maybe uh, Western metro Metropolitan is greater than, uh, maybe it's much better than uh, the Northern Metropolitan. So there's a function uh, that comes in hand to help you with that. That's the one hot encoder. I'll, I'll share this notebook. Uh, it's better you get to know why are things done the way they are done and what's the purpose of everything. Uh, when you get some time, you can actually go through it, okay? Where I don't understand, uh, you can write a question. Uh, I'll leave some minutes uh, for questions and answers, okay? So what the one-hot encoder does, we have no whiteboard. Uh, what the one-hot encoder does, we go back to our case scenario we're using for Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. We said zero for Uganda, one for Kenya, and two for Tanzania. So what the one hot encoder does, it's going to come up with some kind of table, I can say. So if, if somebody is from Uganda, okay, if somebody is from Uganda, it's going to represent, uh, I think that won't be a good case scenario. Let me say one for Uganda, two for Kenya. Uh, okay, let it be that, that way. Zero for Uganda, uh, one for Kenya, and two for Tanzania. So what the one hot encoder is going to do, it's going to generate for you three columns, okay? We are working with three countries. So if somebody is from Uganda, 
it's going to, in those three columns that are going to be generated, Uganda, it will put a one in Uganda, that column for Uganda, it will put there a one, then Kenya zero, then Tanzania zero, okay? Then if somebody is from Kenya, then for the column for Uganda, to put there a zero, one for Kenya, and zero for Tanzania. So if you have several people from Kenya, 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 so in your data set, you'll expect zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, okay? Because that's the encoding for Kenya. Then if maybe you're having multiple people from Uganda in your data set, so you'll expect a one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero. So then from, from TZ, it will be zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. You get the logic, okay? So that's what the one hot encoder does. It wants to break the other hierarchical kind of thing that the label encoder creates. Okay? So how do we implement that? Of course we know it, but how do we implement it? So still, we are still using the circuit land library and still accessing the preprocessing module. So you import the one hot encoder class. So in the same way, you create the, the object, okay? We have created the object at this level. So here, what you're going to do, so the one hot encoder was created to actually complement the label encoder, okay? So we use the output of the, the output of the label encoder is what used as the input of the one hot encoder. So you're using the other numbers, the label encoder generated, and you're passing them as an input to the one hot encoder. Okay, if you realize from my data set, uh, previously I created a copy, that is the, ha the housing underscore copy. I created a copy of that data set, and it's this very data set that I'm going to pass to the one hot encoder. So a lot of things here, this is where I'm passing the data set, okay? And I'm trying to access that column, okay? So, uh, somebody might ask, what is all this for? So, what you should note, the one hot encoder that fit transform is going to return the other column I was trying to explain to you. But that column I explained to you is actually going to be returned in some kind of matrix, okay? It's going to be returned in some kind of matrix. But you want to break it down back to an array. I don't have a whiteboard. It's very hard for me to illustrate that. So it's going to, this will return some kind of matrix. So when it returns the matrix, uh, in PDs, when you're working with, uh, with pandas, we only work with uh, arrays, work with PD series, and work with PD data frames. So we are trying to convert to break that matrix back to an array, okay? We break it back to an array, then I've created a data frame out of that output. So I've created a data frame, and I'm trying to join it at this level. Uh, I'm joining it with my original data set. So if you try to look at the output here, so wherever we had previously the region name, it has been encoded in this way. So wherever we have a 1.0 um, in this column for two, we get to know that that's Northern Metropolitan, okay? Okay, because that's the encoding we have generated. And if you try to look at uh, Western Metropolitan has been encoded in this way, okay? So wherever you see a one in, uh, a one in the seventh, seventh column, you know, that's, metro, that's uh, Western Metropolitan, right? And wherever you see a one in the same column, this one, you know that is Northern Metropolitan, okay? Well, so that's how you always handle categoricals, words, because the models you're actually going to come up with, they don't accept words as input. So we have to always encode them in that way. Yep. So, the other thing you always have to note is, if you try to look at the top of this data set, these last columns are represented by numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, through 8, okay? Then if you're trying to access more functions, maybe you're trying to do further preprocessing, 
using the Escalon library. You will always get errors. It will keep on throwing errors. And the reason as to why it will keep on throwing errors, it's because it does not expect your data frame to have column names that are integers. Okay? Because from the layman's understanding, a column name should be uh, a composition of letters, right? Not words. So you always get those errors. So if you in, in maybe want to standardize your data, as we shall see, it will always return an error. Error. Okay? Until you really turn those columns into words or maybe strings, I can say. So that's what I'm trying, uh, we are trying to do at this level. Uh, we are using the housing.rename. So the dot rename function, what it helps you to do, that you, you of course, renaming, okay? You're removing maybe some previous naming you had uh, to substitute it with something new. So it, uh, when you're applying it, it's some kind of dictionary. So you want to, represent, uh, to replace that zero with an A, uh, a one with a B, two with a C, three with a D, that way, just that way, and an eight with I. And in most cases, when you're dealing with your data, you expect your target, what you're trying to predict, to be at the extra end of your table, okay? So this is what is addressed here. Um, I copied the housing, uh, the price column in my housing data set at this level. So after copying it, I dropped it in the current data set I was working with. Axis 1 implies that you're dropping a column, okay? If you change this to axis to equal to zero, you'll be dropping a row. Dropping is like removing, okay? So I have my, 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 my rows, my columns. So I'm dropping price. It is on axis one. It's a column, right? So I've removed that column. Then I've created it at the extra end, and I've passed in the price that I recorded. So note the changes here, that our previous columns that were named as 0 through 8 are now A to I, and our price column has actually changed to the end of our data frame, OK? So most of our colleagues who, are, who have actually tried to design models, um, of course, some of us are a bit elementary to it, then some people have tried to do it based on your individual research. So in most cases, you find your data at this level, okay? Most cases, you find it at that level. You don't have category because in your data, and always your target is at the extreme end of your table. That's where we normally find our data. So how do you split your data? Somebody might ask, of course, why are we splitting? The reason as to why you're splitting is you want to separate your, your matrix of futures uh, from your target. A matrix of futures is uh, suppose you're designing a model to add two numbers, okay? Uh, that is x plus y equals to maybe s. So s always represents our sum, okay? So if you try to use the traditional programming, of course we shall use s is equals to x plus y. So if you take samples, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that, you can take different samples and get the answer on the other side. So what... Um, uh, modeling is all about is we want we don't want to provide that function x plus y is equals to s okay we want the machine itself to figure out the x plus y is equals to s so how it figures out is we give it x and y values okay and s values a proportion of them i think most of us did some kind of graphing okay uh, we are being provided with coordinates okay it's like providing it with coordinates, x, y, then we are trying to determine s. So we give it a sample of x values and a sample of y values and a sample of the sum. So we want the model to figure out what's the relationship between x and y that gives s. Okay? So how we do that, we normally split our data. Now like for the case of this data, we want to use the whole of this data up to here. We want the model to predict the price. So what we do, we are going to split this data in a way that from here, this would be our matrix of futures. This is the data we are using to train the model. So we call it a matrix of 
futures. Then this is our target, what we are trying to predict. So we are not giving the model some kind of formula that maybe the price was given by adding, maybe multiplying the bathroom by something, adding this, adding this, adding this. We are not giving that to the model. We want the model to figure out what's the relationship between all these columns that gives the price. Okay? So we split our data in such a way that the first splitting we do is from here. We are separating our values we want to predict from our matrix of futures. Okay? Then the other thing is this very data, we are going to break it into two. Okay? So we want to expose to the model a proportion of the matrix of futures, a proportion, and also a proportion of the targets. Okay? Then the rest of the data down will be used for testing. Okay? So we, we are like, if we give this model the very values of maybe different houses, will it predict the price? You get the logic. So the first splitting is here, then the second splitting is here. So how do we do that? So we are splitting our matrix of futures. So in most cases, you can use the ILOG function. So what the ILOG function does, it's, uh, it's going to break for you the data set, but you always provide, you always provide the index. Uh, maybe the, the, in the, the indices of where you want to stop. So if you try to say, I'm trying to uh, break this data set from this. So the first parameter, what it shows, this first parameter shows the columns, okay? Then this last parameter represents the, uh, sorry, the first parameter shows the rows, then the last parameter always represents the columns. So when you put a number in front here, you represent where you want to start, which road you want to start with. Then when you put a number here, it represents which road you want to stop at, okay? Then if you put a number here, it, imp it implies which column you want to start with, okay? And when you put a number here, it represents which column you want to stop at, okay? So if you don't put any number, just the way it is here, it's going to take all columns of that data, okay? Then you realize here we have not put any number, so it will start from the first column of your data set up to the negative one implies that exclude the last column, okay? So this ILOG function, what it is doing, it is taking all columns, then it's reading all rows except the last column. Get the logic? Okay, that's very cool. So if you try to check your futures, uh, this is my futures, if, uh, if I try to print it out, you realize that that price has been eliminated, right? We are no longer having price because it was at the extra end, okay? And it's returned as um, a data frame. A data frame is a table, eh? it's returned in a tabular format, okay? Then, those are our futures, the data we want to use to train our model. So how do you return the target? So the target, of course, now, if you try to read this, this implies that we are taking all rows, but the rows we are only taking of the last column, okay? We are taking all rows of the last column. So that means that what is stored in target is actually just prices. Okay? I don't know. Yeah, I printed it out here. So if you try to see, our target only has prices. However, they are in scientific notation exponent 6. Okay? Only prices. So that's how you can use always the ILOC function to split your data set. So the other thing I told you was uh, splitting your data into uh, a training set and a test set. So what the first splitting we did, the first splitting we did was splitting uh, up to here, right? Because that's the output you are having. So the second splitting is, is going to be along the horizontal. We want to have a fraction up for training and a fraction down for testing. That's Lehman, okay? But that's not how the data is going to be selected. It might be a random process. The algorithm might pick a data sample here, 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 anywhere, okay? But to understand it elementary, that's what you're trying to do. So how do you do that? So splitting your data into the training set and the test set, uh, we use the train test split function, train test split. 
So what the train test split does, it's going to split your data into a training and a test data set. Okay? So meaning that your whole training data set is going to be split into two. Okay? Your matrix of future is going to be split into two. And one portion is going to be stored in the X trade, another proportion is going to be stored in the X, te X test. Okay? Then your prices, which are our targets, are also going to be split into two. Okay? That's our Y train and Y test. The purpose of these data sets is we shall be using Y X train and Y train to train. Okay? Then to test the accuracy of our model, we shall be using the X test and Y test. You get the logic? So X train and Y train, that's basically for training. Then X test is for predicting. We predict values and those predicted values are tested against the Y test. You get the purpose for splitting, okay? So if you try to look at the test split function, it has some parameters, it takes some arguments. So it takes your matrix of futures. What's the data you're going to use? Okay? That's the matrix of futures. I just named it as futures. Then our target, which values are you trying to predict? That's the next parameter. Then the next parameter is your test size. The test size is always a proportion of the whole data set you want, you're working with. So this shows that you want to take 0.5% of your total data set. So this test size parameter, it's, it's going to be random when it is selecting, okay? So it might select the first row, maybe the fifth, the tenth, okay? there's no order. It's random when it is selecting. Then the last parameter, uh, the random state, that's basically for academia. It has nothing to do with training the model. So what this does is that it will always maintain the same test. The same data will be selected whenever you run this function, okay? So if you sell, maybe if you selected the first, second, and third, when you run this cell again, you still select the first, second, and third, okay? But if this is not there, you can run it the first time, it selects the first, second, and third, then the second time it selects maybe the fourth, fifth, and sixth, okay? So this only just maintains that you get the same values of your test split. So you can always look at the shapes. The shapes also tell you a description about that data, okay? So our X train, you can always use the shape function, dot shape function. So this tells you that um, your X train is actually now having this. It's having 26,142 rows and 16 columns, okay? But what you should always note that this value of the X train should always equal the this very value of Y train, okay? If you try to see, it's the same here. And also if you try to see, it's the same here, okay? Because we, we are using this and this to train, this and this to test. So this is uh, uh, a multiple dimensional array. So this shows you that you have uh, this number of columns and this number, this number of rows and this number of columns, okay? 16 columns, then 26,142 rows, okay? That's what that information is all about. Okay, great. Are we still together? So, we are still working with our data. Yes, we have split it, but look at the nature of our data. If you try to look at the bedrooms, you have to look at the land size, 126, still bathroom one, latitude negative 37, 144, four, what, what. So those values are varying in magnitude. So there are some models that when you're training them, they are so sensitive to the magnitudes of the data you're training them with, okay? Because now try to look at the latitude. This is a very big magnitude compared to this, okay? So we always uh, want to have our data standardized in some way so that we don't have such kind of varying big magnitudes. So that takes us to the next uh, session of normalization. So normalization, what it's all about, it helps you to eliminate those big magnitude numbers, okay? So that you have your, your numbers uh, when they are within a specific range. So there are always two options you can use. You can always use the min-max scalar 
So what the min max scalar does, it's always going to go to maybe a specific column. Let's choose one. Uh, one column, bedrooms, okay? It will go to the bedrooms column. It will select the maximum value and the minimum value, okay? So it will use those two values to return a scalar. So that scalar will be used to standardize the rest of the values in that column, to reduce them in some way, to adjust them, okay? Uh, but in most cases, we use the Z-score scalar. If in any case you want to use the min-max scalar, you can use it. You can use it and get a better prediction accuracy. Maybe not, if you, maybe not. You're not restricted. But in most cases, we use the Z-score scalar. So what the Z-score scalar does, uh, it's going to go to a specific column, okay? So in that column, let's say which column? Price, okay? Uh, okay, let me choose maybe latitude. It is going to go to that column, maybe latitude. So it's going to so compute the mean for that column and the standard deviation for that column. So it will use the Z-square standardization. No way I'd write. It's, uh, the formula is you get uh, the current value you're working with, maybe X, you subtract the mean, then you divide it by the standard deviation if you're versed with that method. That's what we are going to use to standardize each value in that specific column. So it will be done for various columns. So rooms, what, what, rooms, bedroom, latitude, longitude. We shall go to those respective columns and in each column we shall compute the mean and the standard deviation for those respective columns. Okay? So when you are standardizing each value, we shall get the current value you're working with. We let sit the mean for that column. Then the result we divide it by the standard deviation for that column. You get how you use the Z-score scalar. So how do we implement that? Of course, you have the intuition of how it works, but how do we implement it? So how you implement it, we are going to, uh, of course, we are still processing. That's why we are still uh, accessing the pre-processing module in the circuit-learn library. So we are importing the standard scalar. The standard scalar is the Z-score scalar. Then if you want to use the min-max, you say from circuit-learn to pre-processing, import min-max scalar. Okay? Then here we are trying to create the objects just the way we did for the simple imputer and other classes we worked with. So we are creating a specific scalar for X and a different scalar for Y. Okay? You might ask why are we creating two different scalars for X and Y? Okay? For the data and for the target. The reason is the structure of our data is different from the structure of our target. Okay? If you remember very well, um, our, our data has over 16 columns, right? But our target has only one column. You get it? So that's why we differentiate their scalars. So I've created a separate scalar for my data and a separate scalar for my targets. Still using the same code, the standard scalar, standard scalar. So to fit scalar today, uh, to fit scalar to your data, what it's going to do, it's going to do go to the specific columns, compute the mean and the standard deviation for the respective columns you're working with in your data. Get the logic. Okay? So, scalar dot fit x train, what it's going to do here, it's going to compute the mean and the standard deviations. Okay? So, the same thing is going to be done for this. It's going to be done for your targets. But... Uh, I'm still passing in some extra things in the carry brackets, right? Uh, what are they for? So when you're working with, uh, with this standard scalar, it always expects that you're going to, uh, to, to provide at least a two-dimensional array. You get it? But uh, the white train, actually, it is a series. It's a PD series. And the PD series, uh, it's structured in one column. You get it? It's one column. So we're trying to reshape it in such a way that um, the number of rows are the length, the length of that column we are working with. Of course, the length will provide the number of rows, okay? How many rows you're having. Then uh, this extra one is actually trying to change it from, uh, fr fr from maybe a 1D to a 2D, okay? This one changes it because this fit scalar won't accept you to input a 1D, okay? These rules are very important because you're going to be given uh, some data set to pre-process and you keep on getting errors. 
and maybe you think you're, you, you're not right or you're not on the right track, but the issue is playing around with the shapes of your data you're working with. So to uh, transforming what you, to transform, you're actually now going in to do the computation, okay? You're getting each value you're working with, you less your mean and divide it by the standard deviation. So we transform our X train and also uh, we transform our training set, we transform our test set, and the same thing is done for our targets. Uh, you realize that we have transformed the Y train and at the same time we have transformed the Y test. So if you try to look at the shapes, I try to see. Uh, white test and white train recently, if you try to recall, had not this one, okay? So it was a series, but right now it has been converted into an array, okay? An umpire array. But still, this is going to affect you. How? The models you're going to train will always expect this white train to always be flattened, uh, to always be a series. It won't expect this kind of array. So you have, again, after turning it into an array, you have to, again, flatten it, like removing this one. Let me make it layman, okay? You have to remove this. It has only to have the length of that array. So that's what the Ravel function does. We are trying to flatten. So whitest.ravel, it flattens, and whitetrain.ravel also flattens. So if you try to look at their shapes, we have eliminated the one, okay? This is what this is the structure that your model expects. It does not expect this structure. However, you should have this structure to standardize. You get it? It's like a feed forward process. You create an array, then you step back. You flatten it. Okay? You will get errors if you don't play around with such logic. Okay. So what does the standardization do? So if you try to look at um, our extreme, previously we had some kind of values, right? Maybe 144, what, what. But right now you, you are seeing negative values and most of them are 0 point something, 1 point something. So that's the standardization. That's all about the standardization. Why are we getting negative values? Here it's negative because the mean maybe is greater than the current value you're working with, okay? Because you say the current value, uh, you less the mean, right? So for that case, it means that your mean was greater than the current value you are working with. So this is the kind of data your model expects, not the other data, okay? So in most cases, you have to standardize. Standardize, but some models don't, most cases don't need you to standardize, some models. But most of them will require standardized values. The same case for why our prices were at exponent six. You remember? Our prices were at exponent six, but if you try to see here, uh, most of them are less than one, zero point something, zero point something, then two point something, and other values, as you can see. So uh, from that session of data preprocessing, we have looked at how do you handle missing values? How do you handle categoricals, okay? Then how do you split your futures and your targets? Then the other thing is how do you uh, generate your, uh, your X train, uh, your X test, your Y train, and your Y test, okay? A sample for training and a sample for testing. We have looked at all that. Then how do you standardize? Don't always forget standardizing. It will always help you to get a better accuracy. So, we are data scientists. The first thing you should realize is that you have to understand your data. If you don't have uh, a better understanding of your data, that means personally you cannot evaluate the performance of your model. You just look at accuracies that, yeah, it's 98%, but most cases the performance of your model is very poor. It's just that you overfitted it. Okay? So you need to understand your data, the nature of your data. Understanding the nature of your data in most cases can help you in the choice of the model you're supposed to use. Maybe you're using nonlinear data and you're, supposed, uh, you're not supposed to use a linear model when you're, you're generating maybe one for that kind of data set. But because you lack uh, an understanding of your data, then you end up using a linear model and you get maybe a far less accuracy than what you intended to get. So that's why data visualization helps us. 
what we can use it for, we can always use it to try to look at what's the correlation between our futures and our target. The correlation is, um, some of you, a few of you who have done physics at maybe your all level, you, 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 maybe you say, as something increases, also this one increases, okay? We're trying to look at that kind of relationship. So let's first generate a simple plot, just a simple plot. So I told you Mathplotlib is the go-to library we use if you're doing some kind of visualization. You're coming up with plots, line plots, bar plots, scatter plots, and wherever. For this case, we are going to use scatter plots. Eh? So how do you plot one? So in the Mathplotlib, we access the pi plot module. Oh, let me go back to that a little bit. Here, around here. We imported Mathplotlib, but we were more interested in the PyPlot module, okay? And also we provided an alias, we are going to use that is the payload, okay? So we are going to use the payload for our visualization. So we are generating a simple plot here. Uh, a moment, just a moment, I get there. So here. So uh, if you want to generate a scatter, of course it is payload.scatter. Uh, if you want to generate uh, a line plot, we use pilot.plot, then we specify the type of line you want to use in one of the parameters here. You can always get the best knowledge and then try to do some research if in case you want to use something extensive in these libraries. So for this case, I want to use the scatter. So what am I trying to scatter? In the scatter, uh, in this, there are some parameters we pass. The first parameter is what's your x value? the x-coordinate, then what's your y-coordinate, okay? So the whole of this is my x-coordinate, and the whole of this is my y-coordinate, and this is the color of the scatters I want, okay? I want them, maybe want them to be colored blue, green, red, whatever you want to use. So somebody might ask, how can this be x, okay? So this is a whole column. This is a whole column for longitude, okay? Of course, the longitude column has very many, values. And I want to plot those very many values so that that will represent my x. Da, 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 all those values under the, uh, the longitude column. That's what I've accessed here. Then for this point, I've accessed the price. Of course, I'm trying to plot the longitude against the price. I want to see that correlation. Okay? So here, the color of my, of, of my dots, I've, I've chosen green. So this, this is just simply the title, okay? Uh, Pilot the title, just a, a title of your graph. Then the X label is what, what, how do you want to name your X axis, okay? So I want to name it as longitude and um, my Y axis, I want to name it as price. Then Pilot the show is what executes the plotting. So this is the output. Oh. Do you mind if I zoom out a bit? Just a bit. Yep, I think that will work. So, of course, this is very important, but the first, uh, uh, the first time you look at it, it might be useless. It can provide you some kind of meaningful information. So, which kind of information can you get from it? So, you can really try to read that, uh, most especially houses within, uh, within maybe 144.8 to around maybe 146 are highly priced. You get it? Because this is against the price. So you know that if somebody tells you, you know, I, I live in some area and the longitude is, is maybe 145. Uh, so you, you can actually predict maybe that house is highly priced. You get it? But look at somebody at this longitude. I think the price It's very low. Right? So if somebody tells you, maybe at long to do one for seven, you can easily tell that's a cheap house. You get it? Depending on this data. But you're not true. I'm saying you can come up with assumptions. Okay? But because if you try to look from this shape, still you have uh, some points around here that are cheap. Means this, these houses here are still what? Cheap. Okay? It's some kind of prediction. So now there are some cases, there's a case scenario where you would love to actually see all your futures you're working with. You want to look at them, all of them as a big picture and try to derive meaning from wherever you have, okay? 
So in most cases, we, we plot some kind of grid. So what I'm trying to mean that is, I want to plot the rooms here, I plot the bathrooms here, I plot um, longitude, latitude, distance, uh, number of bedrooms, number of what, I have that big picture, I just try to look at it. And maybe you never know, I can generate more better insights from such kind of data, okay? So you can always plot a grid. So how do you create one? So this is a figure, generally uh, a figure what it represents, let me call it a frame. It's the whole of the frame. Then the, that frame, you're going to create subplots, okay? Maybe bathroom, distance, longitude, latitude, okay? So that's what the figure represents. Then AXS, this represents uh, a matrix, okay? So you're having that whole space, but you want to plot it in some kind of matrix. So this is a two by three. A two by three, what it means, uh, we are going to use two rows and three columns to plot, okay? So the f at the first point, of course, that will be zero, zero. Then the second one will be zero, one. Then the other one will be zero, two, okay? I'm trying to read the matrix. Then the other one will be one, zero, uh, one, 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 two, okay? Those are the coordinates we have to plot in. Okay? So I've said then figure size, that's just the, the size of the whole frame where you're going to you're going to plot. So we are doing the plotting of each future, each future in our data set against the target. So which features are we having? Which columns are we having? We're having the rooms, uh, distance. Uh, land size, bathroom, latitude, and longitude. Okay? So, how we plot, of course, uh, it is scatter. We provide our X value and the Y value. This is the number, the number of rooms, the price, and then the label we want to use. So, we, report, we repeat that very thing for each matrix. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. Okay? Then down, the set dot uh, X label, it represents... Uh, what do you want to name the x-axis of that, of that matrix? So rooms price for that matrix, then distance price for that and that. So this is the kind of plot um, you generate. Of course, uh, th this shows you price against rooms, your price against distance, price against latitude, and price against bathrooms and whatever. Then, uh, because of time, uh, I just want to show you the complexity of what you can generate. So you can come up with more complex visualizations like these ones, this was just created to try to look at the performance of different models. So the red shows the uh, values that were predicted right, uh, and blue. If you're having these red dots in red, that shows it was predicted well. Then if you're having blue, um, it shows also those blue dots were predicted well. If you try to see here, this, this was some kind of wrong prediction, blue in red. Then red in blue, that was some kind of wrong prediction. So you can always use uh, visualization to get such insights from data. Okay, had a lot to present, but time. Questions? You can give him a round of answers. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much. And we are taking only three questions. Uh, we, uh, Kistus is going to share his notebook after this talk, and also on our website, it will be there. So you can take time to go through uh, each and every uh, thing he was talking about. So only three questions, and then we go for breakfast, which is really waiting for us. Uh, the first one is there. The first two questions are here. Uh, where are you from? You can tell us where you're from. Just in one second, then you tell us. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. My name is Geoffrey from Makerere University. Um, 
I'm going to ask you one question, but I will allow it to have multiple, like A, B, C, D, probably. Uh, one of the biggest challenge when dealing with data is pre-processing. And I just wanted to know what are the specific uh, data quality or issues that you had or that you have encountered when uh, cleaning your data? Because that's the most important step. Because what I know is that smart thinking is the best way. If you ask more questions, you would understand. That is a part of my question. The B part is I just wanted to know how did you handle the missing values? Because you loaded a CSV file where there are missing values. Okay? Because this is the main thing. If we could understand more of the pre processing, I believe the rest of the work is easier. Then, the C part of my question one is how did you deal with the outliers and then the extreme data? If you could throw more lights about that. Then, uh, the D part of the question is basically how did you play around with the inconsistency in the data so that your model can perform very well? And I want to summarize my last question in, in the last bit of your data normalization. How did you transform your data? Those are the five questions, but in one. If you could talk about them briefly, it helps because data science is all about asking questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for those wonderful questions. Um, please, please, would you like us to take us the, the other two? Okay. Then we walk. Okay. The next question. Please be brief as much as possible. All right. Thank you so much. I'm Isaac from Chambugo University. Uh, my question may not be all that technical because I'm a beginner there, but uh, I saw you importing NumPy. For pandas, matplotlib, and, uh, and skitlan, you, at least those ones you have tried to use them, they were visible that you tried to use them. But for NumPy, you imported it, but I didn't see anywhere where you used that, that library. Thank you so much. What was the essence of importing it there? Last question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, it has really been a, a very wonderful session, uh, specifically for the uh, individuals who have gone through the data science experience. Uh, for me, I just want to thank you and also tell the individuals that uh, whenever we are doing data science, we tend to follow a certain specified framework. And that framework is uh, mainly defined by the experience that you get in the quality of, I mean, uh, the experience that you get whenever you are doing data science. So my advice in addition to what he has given us through training is, let's try it ourselves. Whenever you try it yourself, you will always discover the tiny things that he may not have presented. Thank you. My name is Adam Ali from Islamic University in Uganda. Kiss to serve at you in just two minutes, please. Thank you. Okay, two minutes. So I'll start with his question, uh, where I used NumPy. Um, the first case was I was trying to transform a sparse matrix generated by the one hot encoder. I was trying to turn it into a two-dimensional array. And uh, the end result of it, I used it as uh, a data frame, a greater data frame out of it. NumPy will always be used in the middle, okay? If you're trying to transform, because it's more of transformations and computations, that's where we shall be using it. Uh, I thank you, sir, for your compliment about the quality of data. Then uh, let me hit on his questions. Uh, for the case, for the first case, the data I loaded, the external data had a lot of missing values. And this is an introduction. I can say I used a lot of elementary methods to eliminate missing values. 
uh, I use the mean strategy mode and the median. Those are some of the strategies I use to handle missing values. And it is always recommended the data set you're working with always have some missing values. It's always a requirement if you're working with some kind of data set. Then the other thing is uh, to really improve my model. It was still elementary, not too much was being expounded on. But there are still some other advanced ways we can pre-process our data or manage our data to improve our model quality. One of it all, one of it is maybe if you're working with larger data sets or maybe you want to get columns that are very important. We normally do a dimensional reduction, PCA, LDA, okay? If you want to, uh, to do some kind of reduction, then uh, in most cases we use the convariance matrices to generate uh, better columns, the ones we can use to to better predict whatever we are predicting. Because not everything in your data set is important, okay? If you are trying to record maybe students' attendance, uh, now what's the importance of a column noting the student's color of cloth? It is not important, we eliminate it. Then there's also cross-validation, I didn't use that. It is more advanced to grid search to, imp to improve models. I didn't use that because those are a bit advanced, okay? Okay, I think uh, because of time, I can cut it there. So there are a lot of uh, advanced methods I can say we can normally use, okay? But for this session, it was a bit elemental, eh? and some things were not touched, okay? Thank you. Uh, have I answered something? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chesutu. Please, let's clap for Mr. Chisitu again. Uh, Mr. Chisitu is an undergraduate uh, student here. It's, it's actually not very common to find an undergraduate student giving such an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. So I think I can comfortably say for some of us who came with questions and um, difficulties in handling data, working with libraries, I think Mr. Chisitu's elaborate tutorial has uh, brought us clarity on this concept. Now uh, we are going to have a short tea break. Our tea is going to be served. There's a room that is opposite this one here. Uh, we shall be guided, we shall see it. So after the break, we have more exciting tutorials coming up. It's going to be, it's, it's a vibrant day. Okay. So we shall reconvene in 30 minutes for the next tutorial. Please enjoy your break. Okay. We may just walk out for the tea.
Yes, please. Yes, please. Sorry? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I don't know whether I'm audible from that side. Good afternoon, 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 good afterno
Talking about the and about the about the about the about analytics has two parts. And under data engineering, uh, we are talking about uh, how do we get data from different sources and we put it at one source and we transform it into a form or we turn it into a form that is suitable for the subsequent uh, 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 operations. And these subsequent op uh, operations after we have obtained data and we've transformed it into the form that you want, is what we call data analytics. Uh, I'm Emmanuel Ahishaki. So basically, what is data engineering? Uh, this data engineering has existed for some time now, and uh, it has been, it's being used by companies, organizations, businesses in predictive analytics, basically making predictions in descriptive analytics, and uh, making reports. And uh, this word uh, became common in 2010, uh, in 2010s and, and, and above, when the, the rise of data science came, uh, 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 came along. So basically, data engineering is defined as the movement, uh, movement, how we get the data from different sources, how we, how we manipulate this data, and how we manage this data. So it involves uh, that movement, how we manipulate and how we manage it. So a data engineer is supposed to have the skills in, in those three aspects. And uh, data engineering is also an intersection of data security. So how we provide security to the data, how we manage data, how we operate, how, uh, the data ops basically talks about the data operations and data architecture, Data concentration, which also talks about how we get data from different sources into and we aggregate it into one source, and then software engineering. And a data engineer basically is the person or is someone who performs the work of uh, the whole aspect of data uh, engineering. So, how is data engineering and, and uh, data science related? Here are some people, there's a lot of debate whether data science or data engineering, which one encompasses the other. In the basically uh, uh, small organizations or uh, small and medium enterprises, you find someone who is employed as data scientist uh, also works or does the work of data engineer and vice versa. But in big enterprises, you find these data scientists are responsible for making sure that data comes in and it is aggregated and it is transformed into suitable formats, while for data science, uh, all data scientists are the other people who do the other analytics side. So basically, these data engineers, they provide inputs because they make sure that data is gotten from different sources, whether IoT systems, whether databases, whether uh, streaming from YouTube, uh, getting the, 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 the views. And then that data is transformed into a format that is suitable for uh, data scientists uh, to use in their uh, uh, at all then insights in, uh, from those data sets. So basically, this is a data science hierarchy. Uh, starting from the bottom going up, the first three operations at the bottom uh, uh, is basically the work of data engineers, getting data from different sources, storing the data, and transforming the data into the suitable formats for the operations, which data operations include, including uh, includes basically the top, uh, the top uh, 
are most operational. So that, that's how data engineering and data science are, are interrelated. So we have skills that are basically needed for data engineering. Uh, uh, someone needs uh, skills in data security, in data management, in data operations, and how to build data architectures and software engineering. So uh, if you are... Uh, doing that work. But in big operations, you find a specific a data engineer, uh, at least should be having uh, the knowledge of skills in, in, in that domain at this stage. So we have the languages that uh, these uh, data engineers should be knowing. For example, SQL, uh, that, that is the language uh, uh, used, used in these rational databases, because we are saying that data is from different sources, maybe from rational databases, and you want it to very much important. Then you need uh, of recent the knowledge of Python. Uh, Python has taken over in in this data engineering, in in data science, in machine learning. So you need knowledge of Python. Then you also need uh, knowledge of of uh, Java or Scala, and also you need uh, knowledge of of. Rhinox or Unix, uh, uh, basically this bash. So uh, uh, as someone who is aspiring to be a data engineer, or uh, you, you need uh, uh, good knowledge in, in these uh, languages. And this is basically how a data engineer relates to other roles. So from what you have seen from their slide, you need basically knowledge of software engineering, you need uh, knowledge of, of, of the, the, the data architecture, data operation is so but you find uh, if it is a big organization you work together with software engineers data architects and uh, uh, this uh, dev operation but uh, if it is a small enterprise all those operations on the left are done by data engineers and the output uh, all the, the results are fed on the right so the the processed data is used by data analysts used by data scientists and machine learning engineers. So basically what we expect from uh, data engineers is to have data from different sources, uh, collected in one source, transformed into a suitable format for these other data analytics, or, or, or data, for, for data analysts, for data engineers, and machine learning engineers, or other operations of the business to be done. I had uh, the, the, the first, the, the area presenter who presented the introduction to Python programming, uh, some questions on how data was transformed, prepared, so on. So you find that that work is supposed to be the work of data engineers. So when work, when data is now ready, or it is ready transformed, then it is used by these other subsequent uh, 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 people, uh, operators. Uh, then uh, this is a whole life cycle of data engineering, and basically that's where the, the presentation is, 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 is best. So we have data generation. This data generation is, you, you get data from different sources, uh, databases, from online visits, from IoT systems, and this data is ingested or it is collected in, in, a, in one source, in the data warehouse, data map, or, or data lake. Uh, uh, oh, anyway, you, you want that data to be uh, converged to. Uh, then it could also include this streaming data. Then this uh, data is transformed under transformation. So you under transformation, you deal with missing data, you, you deal with duplicates, you deal with how can I transform this data into a format that is uh, suitable for my operations. Then it, uh, on serving, you see, serving is operation that gives machine learning, that gives analytics, that gives report.
Uh, okay, sorry. So uh, uh, the operations that are done under storage, they are basically extract, transform, and uh, and load it operations. So this serving, it it basically happens when data is already uh, uh, transformed into suitable formats for the that, that are good for the business operations or the company operations. So when data is transformed, it is used by machine learning engineers, by data analysts, and also for reporting. And underlying uh, uh, these operations of data generation, then ingestion, transformation, and serving, we have data security. So how do we provide security to this uh, data? Because it should be accessed by people who are supposed to access it. How do we manage data? So this one includes data security, data management, and data operations. We have policies that we, we, we put uh, in place. So data architecture, how do we put on pi pipelines that basically, uh, the pipelines that make sure that data is available, data is streaming, if it is streaming or it is coming from IoT systems, how can we make that uh, those systems uh, so that we have data that we need for the business uh, operations. Then data concentration, basically, how do we manage to get data from these are different places. Uh, for example, we, we can get data from IoT, we can get data from from, from uh, relational databases and find the same data is serving the, 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 the one organization. Then uh, all that work, uh, uh, the software engineers or software engineering skills, how can we create APIs that can allow fast, uh, 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 that can allow data to come in from these pipelines and also where data is transferred then uh, used by uh, sub, uh, used in subsequent operations by machine learning engineers, analysts, and so on. So the major uh, undercurrents I've I've already talked about security data management and so on. I've already talked about uh, in the previous slide. So now this part of data analytics, uh, we talk about. So when data is transformed, we use this data in in uh, to make business decisions. That's when we do. Uh, uh, predictive analytics, if you want to do predictions and so on, or how, want to do descriptive analytics, or want to create reports for the business. So all that work happens in, in data serving or in, in analytics side of, of data engineering. So basically, in, in, in summary, data engineering talks about how can we get data from different sources, we ingest or we, correct, uh, we, we, we have this data at at, at one central point in data lake, data warehouse, uh, data maps, uh, and then transform this data into suitable formats using uh, uh, data transformation operations. Then this data can be served to different uh, different departments or different uh, different purposes. And uh, uh, basically, that, that, that's what uh, I, I have to for today. Uh, uh, there is a, a short video of 14 minutes that uh, I shared and the, the organizer said it's good that you watch it in your free time. But it talks about uh, the, 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 the existing tools, for example, for data analysts, uh, the data uh, analytics, we talk about Tabru, we talk about VI, we talk about, so that video talks about the current tools for each of the operations that I've talked about, if you are talking about data ingestion, what are tools that we need from those tools? Because I have limited time, uh, uh, that, that video is basically explaining all, all what you need to, to know or do as, as data uh, engineer. Thank you very much. Uh, I welcome questions.
Doctor, as Shakir has recommended that we watch, it will be playing shortly. You can share the video. Dr. Emmanuel, Dr. Emmanuel, are you still with us? Let me just check whether Dr. Emmanuel is still with us. Stability issues can derail the success of even the best apps. Buggy apps make so. The sole purpose of data engineering is to take data from the source and save it to make it available for analysis. Frankly, it's so simple, like it's not even worth talking about. You click on a video and YouTube saves this event in a database. The exciting part is what happens yeah. after. How will YouTube use its machine learning magic to recommend other videos to you? But let's rewind a bit. 
Was it really that uh, simple yes, to put your click into a database? Yes, Let's yes, have a look at how data physical. engineering works. They mm. are trying, I think, to get in touch with you and they, can. they are unable. I don't know why. Okay. Imagine a team with an application. Uh, the application works fine. Traffic grows and sales are selling. They track results of Google Analytics, the CRM. I can't, so I, I, I don't know. Okay, because it seems they had a lot of questions. And uh, I'm seeing they are trying, I was watching on YouTube and they are trying to get in touch with you, but it's hard, I, I can't tell. Uh, maybe if they can send me the question, is that then I try them. Uh, then they try to go to YouTube side and see. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Emma, 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 for taking us through the fascinating world of data science and analytics. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Uh, we are now aware of what skills to acquire and polish if we want to become uh, good, good data engineers. Uh, we will have 10 minutes to allow questions from the audience. In the interest of time, we will take three minutes from, I mean, three questions from three different people. So the question and answer session is open. You may ask uh, Dr. Achakir. Dr. Achakir. Dr. Questions? Oh, thank you. There's one here. Thank you very much. I, mine is not uh, in form of a question, but uh, some kind of comment in addition to what my colleague has just uh, uh, presented. Um, you know, it's very difficult to identify that in line between data engineering and data science. And uh, normally what uh, we do is uh, you come from the science point of view, then you dive into the engineering point of view of data, uh, of, of data engineering. Now, uh, when you want to build a career in that lane, one of the things you need to do is to passionately look at what you can achieve out of your data science or your data engineering. Uh, you start by creating a career in that field. You can choose to become a researcher or you can choose to become a practitioner. That's one thing we need to do. The second thing which we must always do as data scientists is to build ourselves a toolbox. The earlier presentation which we had, uh, our colleague, gave us a notebook. And that notebook is basically a toolbox. So you can build a toolbox in any language that you need to become a data scientist. You can choose to say, I want to use uh, Python, I want to use R, and whatever other languages do exist. And then uh, my colleague talked about issues that relate with other fields, software engineering, uh, computer science, whatever it is. Uh, one thing I've come to realize of recent is that you don't need to become an expert of mathematics or an expert of computer science or an expert of computer engineering to be a data scientist. That one I assure you. Because the whole of your career that you're going to build in data science is strictly based on your passion. And all these tools, you can build them yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay.
Thank you so much, Doctor. I have one question, which is divided into two. The first one, um, inquiring of the the use of a software engineer in, in data engineering, like what that skill of software engineering do in data engineering. And also, I want to know the real difference between data engineering and data science. The two look alike so much. Dr. Emmanuel, will you, would you like to take the second question and answer them at once, or you'd like to first answer this one? The, the question was on the difference between data science and data, engin uh, and data engineering. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel? Please bear with us as the technical team uh, connects with Dr. Emmanuel. No, uh, can I proceed with answering? Uh,
sharing life cycle. And I'm a little bit curious about uh, the ingestion life cycle because every day technology keeps changing. And to me, if you are in the industry, you should be a little bit updated with the current technologies. So I want to know what are the current tools that are being used at industry level for dealing with ETL, which is extract, transform, and then load the data. That's my A part of the question. My B part of the question is basically because I'm a big data an uh, analyst. So I have this problem of dealing with real-time data processing and batch processing. So how, how do you handle uh, real-time and batch processing in any data engineering pipeline? Now my last question, which is the C part of the question, which I probably pray doctor could throw more lights on it, because I want him to share with us his experiences when it comes to dealing with the best practices for data quality. Because I believe that our biggest problem as data scientists is, before we even get any insight about any data, is the kind of the quality of the data. So I'm, I'm a little bit curious if you can share with us his best practices, how we can go about uh, data quality so that we can also be able to have that quality assurance of our data validation in any data engineering pipeline. Thank you. That's, those are the three questions, the ABC questions that I really pray probably would be answered. Thank you. is also online from New York. So she couldn't make it here this week, but she, she's ready to give us a talk. Let's hear from Dr. Rose Nakasi, who is going to talk about, um, let me just be sure. Yeah. Dr. Rose Nakasi is going to talk about computer vision applications in health. Uh, she's done so much work in health. Uh, I think all that is there, but I can give a brief introduction still in her recent uh, award in health. In health. In so, health. She's so she's done a work in uh, malaria diagnosis uh, using AI in microscopy. Uh, this has won her so many awards with the recent one, google.org, uh, a prestigious award. So I think from her talk, we are going to listen to how uh, you can relate uh, AI in different uh, aspects of health. Um, uh, we have so many challenges in health, but I think all those are in her talk. So uh, let's give a chance to Dr. Rose. Dr. Rose, are you there? for that kind introduction. 
uh, where I am, it's a good morning, uh, but I guess in Uganda right now, it's a good afternoon. And thank you for organizing uh, this wonderful session on data science and how it's applicable for solving some of the most pressing uh, burdens in our settings. I'll be talking to a topic on artificial intelligence in health and specific to that, I'll delve onto the mobile microscopy for malaria. I'll give a brief talk about uh, this, then I'll be able to introduce a tutorial uh, thereafter. As uh, Dr. Godliver has introduced me, I'm Rose Nakasi, a lecturer in Busitema University of Computer Science, uh, as well as a research scientist at the Macquarie Artificial Intelligence uh, Lab. Um, when you talk about artificial intelligence in health, and Godliver, you should be able to tell me if you can see my screen so that I can proceed as well as hear me so that I know that we are all moving at the same pace. Can you, can you hear me? Can I proceed? Sorry, okay, but I think she can't hear us anyway. Can, can you hear me now? Okay, you can proceed. You can proceed. Uh, there, 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 there. there. artificial intelligence and in different domains um i will not be able to talk to the topic of artificial intelligence because i know my colleagues have been able to uh, duly uh, speak to this topic but i'll delve into the use of it in specific domain for health and to this we are looking at it in the ways that artificial intelligence is supporting uh to improve human well-being and uh, reducing suffering as well as extending a healthy life. And to that, we are trying to address the sustainable development goal number three, which is uh, better health for all. Uh, and if we go down to malaria, we are trying to address um, the end of the scourge of malaria uh, by 2030. And those are some of the questions that we're trying uh, to address. And how to perform healthcare, of course, uh, artificial intelligence has proven its efficiency in the prevention of disease, in the way the disease is diagnosed, in the treatment of the disease. Uh, but specific to my talk, I'll delve on to the topic on diagnosis because that is one of the major control measures if we are to uh, improve uh, human well-being as well as uh, reduce uh, the endemicity of uh, these diseases trying to answer here was how are we going to use artificial intelligence to be applied in the way certain diseases are diagnosed and so uh then we also want to answer these uh, questions like what are some of the ways to do this of course we have uh different data sets disease management for example in the way we are trying to diagnose the disease and, and treating but as well as the entire ecosystem of population uh health management uh, and that is uh, the scope of the research that I've been involved in for quite some time. If we talk about the disease malaria, to us who are in low and middle income countries, it's not a disease out of the blue. Most of us have had it and it's a disease that is spread by a mosquito bite. Uh, when we look at the WHO statistics about the disease, it accounts for over 3.4 billion cases, and that's globally. Uh, we see that so many patients wait in waiting for a correct diagnosis uh, for malaria specifically. 
But uh, what is the diagnostic challenge that is faced in most of our healthy facilities? One, we have different diagnosis measures. We know we do have uh, measures such as RDTs, uh, but for those, especially the medics that have used RDTs, they will tell you that. Withstanding, we have a gold standard mechanism that was approved by the WHO, which is by the use of the microscope. But again, the challenge that comes with the microscope is one, we have very few uh, trained lab technicians in most of the healthy facilities to be able to man the gold standard mechanism, uh, which is by the use of uh, the microscope, especially in highly endemic uh, areas such as Uganda. If we can scoop a statistic that came in from Ghana, it was noted that there is 1.72 microscopes per 100 population. But then out of that big population, there were only 0 0.85 trained laboratory staff to manage that 100,000 population. So you realize that vis-a-vis -vis the number of microscopes that are available in most of the public health facilities, again, is the number of the trained uh, lab technicians to be able to man the gold standard, we see a very small number of uh, the experts to be able to carry out uh, the gold standard mechanism, not forgetting its other limitations uh, that come with the microscopy diagnosis, whereby WHO, according to the standard operating procedure, uh, does not require a microscopist or a technician to view uh, more than 30 to more than 20 to 30 slides in a day. And those are an equivalent of the number of patients that come to a given healthy facility. But given the few numbers of uh, lab technicians, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the big numbers of patients that come for a correct diagnosis, you see that this is lying low against the standard operating procedure. Whereas we also don't want to forget the other hindrances that come with microscopy. Uh, given the fact that it is eye straining and in the image on the sides there, you can see a lab technician trying to strain his eye to view for all those pathogens under the microscope. So the mechanism in itself, not only according to the standard operating procedure, but also the way it is operated, you'd realize that it's very much straining, especially for the eye. And what does that mean? That then leaves us with very less diagnosis throughput uh, for the big numbers of patients that come to different healthy facilities for a, an accurate uh, diagnosis. But that also notwithstanding, we also have variations in individual expert judgment. And where I mean by this is that if we give a microscope to different microscopists to look out for what they see under the microscope, uh, you're going to realize that most of them are going to have variations in what they judge of what they see under the microscope. So what is uh, what is the solution that we try to propose here? Our proposition here is hinged on uh, the capabilities of artificial intelligence, but as well as equipment that are available to us, for example, the, the smartphones, which are now on market even in highly endemic malaria, endemic uh, settings like Uganda. But we also looked at the statistics which showed that at least in each and every healthy center falls, we always have a microscope there. So leveraging on the capability that we do have the equipment, for example, the smartphone and the microscope, as well as the capabilities that come with artificial intelligence, uh, we can be able to support image analysis, and this has potential to improve uh, microscopy uh, diagnosis for diseases such as malaria. In that prototype, you see uh, in the image here, what we do is that uh, we developed a 3D printable adapter because we want the image through the microscope to come straight on the smartphone. We had to devise ways of providing an attachment of this phone onto the eyepiece of the microscope. So we 3D printed an adapter uh, that aligned the smartphone onto the eyepiece of the mic onto the eyepiece of the microscope so that we can be able to um, to generate an image 
that comes straight through the eyepiece to come uh, straight away on the smartphone. This way, this has uh, a number of potential capabilities, not only for image analysis, but you see that it already solves uh, a problem of eye strain when it comes to uh, the lab technicians. So when the image comes onto the eyepiece of the microscope, we are able now to capture the image and several images. This was done in collaboration with the experts in Mulago Hospital. And the idea was they were aligning us to the true definition of what uh, the parasites or the pathogens that we were looking for in the image are. And through this, uh, we were able to generate a big corpus, a big number of images uh, that were annotated or labeled uh, by the experts in the different, in the in Mulago uh, Healthy Facility. Uh, the idea for doing this is that we wanted to give uh, the model, the artificial intelligence model, characterizations of what the parasites are uh, so that they can learn all the characteristics uh, of the objects of interest. And in this case, an example here uh, was uh, the characteristics of the, uh, of the malaria parasites. Uh, like I've told you, uh, in this exercise, what we had to do was to generate what we call positive patches and what we call positive patches because this is an image with so many uh, objects on it, but our major interest was the malaria parasite. So characterizing them was then labeling them as positive patches and now what we are referred to as the malaria parasites and any other part of the image uh, we are referred to as the negative patches. Uh, and this is a classical example of a classification task where we want to be able to classify whether any part of the image is a malaria parasite or rather a, any other part which is a negative patch. Uh, after generating a big number of uh, these examples, we had to train them uh, using a deep learning model which is based on the convolutional neural network architecture. The idea is once you input the image and the beauty with uh, CNN, it's a classical deep learning model, which is able to learn characteristics uh, of the objects of interest from data itself without having us to manually uh, extract the morphological characteristics of the objects uh, that we're looking at here. And I'll be able to take you through these uh, explanations in our tutorial. So once the model was uh, trained, we had to do an evaluation uh, of the model to see how it performs against the different other machine learning um, machine learning models. Uh, of course, I've told you that convolutional neural network is a deep learning architecture, uh, but we had to try it with another shallow machine learning model, which relies on extracting the morphological characteristics of the objects of interest. And the idea here was to evaluate its performance to see if in actual sense, it actually performs better uh, on detecting the parasites. And you could see that for the malaria case, our area under the curve was striking up to 100%, which is an AUC of one, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the counterpart of the shallow learning model, which uh, performed at 0 0.96. Uh, for us to gain confidence of the results, we had to, again, uh, just oppose this to other uh, microscopic uh, challenges, for example, tuberculosis and intestinal parasites. And as you can note, uh, the model actually performed and scaled out uh, better even on other challenges. The idea with this is that we wanted to know if the model can actually work not only for malaria, but for any microscopical uh, challenge. And this was a proof of concept that it can actually do perform uh, very well on the different uh, computer vision uh, challenges. So for us to draw inference on uh, the model performance. Of course, we have seen very good curves here and they are performing very well. We wanted to also know that uh, indeed the model is performing as it uh, highlights in uh, the graphs. And the idea was, can we be able to do a validation of our results against those that come from the expert 
uh, manual annotations. So in the image right here, you see is a malaria uh, thick blood smear image uh, that was duly annotated uh, by the experts. And those are the white bounding boxes that you see in the background. And again, it's them are the model performances using our convolutional neural network model uh, that is highlighted with the uh, with the with the with the red uh, bounding boxes. Again, you can see and note that indeed the inference of the model against the expert uh, validation uh, annotations struck very well, especially for the malaria parasite. To an extent that it was even able to capture that that was missed. Uh, by the expert uh, annotator. Uh, on the right is a, a tuberculosis sputum image. Uh, this sputum image, again, we gave the image, a test image that was run, that was run under the model, uh, first to be annotated by the expert microscopists in Mulago, uh, and those are represented by the white bounding boxes that you can see. Again, by inference, by way of inference, by the model, you can be able to note that indeed the model again performed uh, very well. But we again can see that there is a bacilli that was annotated by uh, the expert, uh, but it was missed by the model. And of course, those are some of the key factors that have been driving us to be able to improve uh, the, perform the performances of the models. Uh, through the different iterations of work uh, engaged in. Uh, we have gone way past just looking at the detections of the parasite, and we want now to have this solution to scale out for every aspect of uh, malaria diagnosis or ma microscopy of malaria diagnosis. So instead of just looking at what we call the trophozoites, which are the malaria parasites, we had to scale it out to be able to look at uh, parasitemia. Again, we are leveraging the power of, uh, of, of convolutional neural networks to be able to support uh, a procedure for uh, multiple or multi-class uh, detection uh, tasks. And in this example, you can see that we are able to detect not only the trophozoites, which are the malaria parasites, but as well as uh, we are able to also look at other aspects as speak to uh, malaria diagnosis The bit about this uh, problem, uh, especially in computer science, is that it was able to give us uh, the capability to not only look at one class object detection tasks, but to scale it further to look at multi class object detection uh, tasks. And in variations, you can see that the white blood cell is a bigger object vis-a-vis -vis that of uh, the, the this trophozoites. So it became a very good classical example for application uh, of machine learning uh, for different sized and different scenario and different mouth class uh, detection tasks. And indeed some of the models that we developed, again, you can see that uh, they scaled very well uh, to these kinds of problems. Again, still, you can see uh, around the SSD model, we are still missing out on some of the trophozoites. And I, and, and I uh, still re-echo that these are some of the more pressing needs that we need to investigate why the model is at some points not behaving well. And we find and forge ways to be able to make the model uh, very perfect in its detections. So here, this was the ground truth image after the model was uh, after the model was applied. Uh, these are the detections that come out of of, of that. So statistically speaking, uh, we have been able to do de uh, detections. And again, it's the model that I have just represented here, first the RRCNN and the SSD model. We had to first uh, carry out different experiments to be able to investigate the performance of the model against uh, different scenarios where we were running it only for the malaria parasites only. Again, you see the precision is around 0 0.6 and the recall is 0 0.2. Uh, for the first RRCNN, again, you can see 
uh, that for the bigger objects vis-a-vis -vis the smaller objects, uh, the model was performing way better than uh, the smaller objects. And for the concatenation of both uh, the trophozoite and white blood cells, again, you see an improvement uh, of the model from 0.55 as the mean average precision uh, to 0.66. Uh, and then for the SSD model, of course, here we are trying to appreciate the performance attributes of the model, uh, again, of the different models. So here we're comparing the faster RCNN model vis-a-vis -vis the SSD model uh, that was running on the mobile phone. And of course, in our research, we realize that, of course, much as the faster RCNN is performing uh, better than the SSD mobile net, but here we have a trade-off of where you want now to incline the model for deployment. If you are deploying your model on, a, of course, you'd wish to go for one that gives better performance, which is the faster RCNN. But if you want to deploy it on a more low-resourced platform like uh, the smartphone, then the mobile net SSD model becomes handy. So it's always a trade-off, again, that we have to solve as a challenge going forward when we are looking at the different uh, machine learning models that we are going to use in health. Uh, in health, we have to be and what we want to achieve should always align with uh, coming up with results uh, that are safe for the patient, uh, but as well as uh, that are ethical enough. So we had to delve more on relying on the more accurate one or that that gave better precision. But whereas we were looking at the mobile deployment, of course, the SSD model always is uh, very light for low resourced uh, equipment. Uh, we're able to come up with the mobile application, and that's where we're able to apply the SSD mobile net as well as CNN model for better inference, especially on a web based application. You can be able to check out this work. Uh, to get the details of it. So what are our next uh, research steps? Our next research steps is that we've been able to achieve a con proof of concept of how ML can be used uh, for one, to achieve computer vision, but as well as to be able to achieve a computer vision application in health, especially when it comes to uh, the diagonistics that I'm speaking to right now. So there is already proof that there is capability that artificial intelligence can be able to support um, applications in medical, uh, in medical, in in medic in health and medical applications. And our next step right now is whereas you're not achieving a hundred percent AUCs or map here, there is need to improve these results because, like I've told you, in health, what matters is to be able to reduce the false alarms, which present themselves as false negatives, uh, all false positives. So the idea is how can we be able to do that to, you know, to improve the performance of what we currently have? One way is to have a bigger data set, and that's what usually speaks to any uh, machine learning problem, is that what you need is the models are very data hungry, so they take in as much more data. So the more data they take in or the more examples they take in, the more they become better. So we believe that with the huge representative benchmarking data sets around uh, microscopy for health, for, for malaria. And here we're taking into consideration both for the thick blood smear and the thin blood smears. And uh, this the problem I've been speaking to was mainly for uh, thick blood smears, which usually speak to malaria parasite detection or malaria diagnosis. But of course, like I said, there are so many aspects around a microscopy of malaria where we talk about thin blood smears and we want to investigate issues of species identification, uh, issues of um, stages of growth of the of the of the parasite of the malaria parasites, and all that then requires us to curate another data set of thin blood smears uh, to be collected to be able to investigate all those possibilities if we are to arrive a very formidable solution around AI uh, for microscopy. And then we, after generating this big uh, benchmarking data set, we believe that we shall be able to then develop a robust analytical tools for the malaria detection basing on the different tasks 
around malaria detection that we're going to be looking at based on the data that we are collecting. And we believe that this will be uh, one of the pop of, of the open sourced uh, benchmarking data set that will drive uh, different machine learning tasks around to come up with robust uh, analytical tools. And from that, we also know that uh, we can be able to fuse both diagnosis into real-time and real-time surveillance. That once a diagnosis comes off real time, then it can be uh, integrated into the different uh, electronic health management systems uh, for real-time surveillance. We believe that this will go a long way uh, towards informing um, records by government uh, for better surveillance of the disease. Uh, in the different uh, in the different uh in the different regions in Uganda so this work has been supported by Google we do appreciate Positema University where I work Makere artificial intelligence lab there is support that's coming in from the lacuna Kanaji corporation and our uh, from Molago and Chirudo if there is any question on this before I delve into uh, the a brief tutorial, I'll be glad. But Liva, can you hear me? Linda from Makerere. Um, I can write myself as a beginner with, um, in relation to machine learning. So while you were presenting, you really talked so much about models. So here is my question. I want to understand it like in layman's language, what is a model? If I had to explain it to my grandmother in the village, how would I explain it to her to understand or to a five-year-old kid? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rose, would, would you like to have all the questions or you want to uh, respond as they ask? Which way, which way would you want? Which which yeah, we can have all of them at a go and then I can be able to respond to them. I believe we can restrict them to like a few three and then we shall take others probably after the, the brief tutorial uh, so let's have we shall have him then over there uh, thank you doctor for that wonderful presentation my name is Kisitu Alfred so in your presentation you talked about using a microscope and a mobile a mobile phone so my concern is about uh, the quality of images you're generating. Yes, the scan from the microscope might be okay, but remember the picture or the image the, the mobile phone is going to take is going to be limited to its image resolution. So do you have figures or metrics of the minimum pixels a phone is required to be having if in case you apply such a model in any clinical department? Thank you. Doctor, may we take five questions? Can we please add two more? Because there are more than because there are. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bais Raja from Makere University. Now, uh, Doctor, you talked about uh, comparing your model to other models. And I'm also a beginner. But what I found out is that uh, when you're working with different scenarios, you compare your model with other models. Now, I want to know why did you compare your model with those other two specific models? And the next question is, how did you connect the computer vision to your machine learning to give you the graphical structures that you presented? Thank you. Uh, there was another question here. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I'm Danson Taremwa 
from Bara University of Science and Technology. Uh, doctor, you, you talked of uh, CNN architecture uh, being a model that needs huge amount of data in order to make an accurate prediction. Now, in the European countries, US and so on, getting data is very easy. So in the setup of Africa, Uganda in particular, which methods can one use to collect huge amount of data to run these models with accurate results? Thank you, doctor. Let's have one more question, the last one. Okay. Put on, he put up his hand first. Thank you, Doctor. My name is uh, Natwasa Isaac. I wanted to ask, I saw your image where I used the font magnify your pick from a microscope. Now, if you were to check the cost of that phone you are using, I saw that phone could be like an iPhone or what. I'm asking, can't we use some other display screen that can bring that image instead of using a phone? Uh, doctor, those are the questions. Doctor requested for three questions, and we've given five. Can you hear us? Can. I can. Uh, thank you for those wonderful questions. Um, I didn't capture the name of the first uh, participant who asked about uh, what a model is. And this model will come out... Um, well, if you to ask me what a model is, to be able to explain it to a grandmother in the village, um, what I this what we call a model is we get as many examples as possible, just oppose it to this convolutional. If I may go back. Can you see my full screen? All right. So once we get examples from here, the artificial intelligence model is one that is able to learn the characteristics of these objects of interest. So if, for example, we are looking at what characterizes a malaria parasite in this in this scenario what characterizes a malaria parasite is that we describe from the description that was given to us by the microscopists what the morphology of the malaria parasite is which is a dot and a ring around it a chromatic ring around it but this is also in respect to the color. So we have the color shape of this object. So if we give the machine learning model, and I want to explain it very uh, well, not to bring in the gymnastics of the model that we see here, is that if I get examples of this, so that I teach this model here to learn the characteristics of what a malaria parasite is. We are giving it as many examples as possible. So that training that goes on to learn the characteristics of what it picks from the data, once it has learned a lot, 
it will be able to now uh we shall be now able to come up with a trained model that has learned the characteristics of what it has been told to learn in the data so that now becomes a trained model that we shall now once we bring in a new test image it is able to get inference from what it has been able to learn now if i can break this convolutional neural network architecture into the way we understand and that was the whole thinking around the convolutional neural network and the reason why you hear the word neural network is that it's based on the way our brains are able to perceive different objects take a scenario when you are still a young child when we are still young we try to make our all our parents do try as much as possible to get us to detect different objects around it over time once you told that this is a book tomorrow you told that this is a book once you told as many times as possible your brain is able to conceive a concept that oh every time i look at such an object i am able to perceive that this is a book that is the same way that this model was also built and that was the whole intuition around developing it that you give the model simple smaller tasks to learn of the characteristics of that image so it filters out it filters out the different characteristics then along the way it goes on improving the learning so it first learns simpler objects of the ob it first learns simpler features of the object then over time it will be able now to perceive very other more complex features of that object and that is what these layers are doing first the pulling will come and pull out the simple filters that speak to an object small pieces of the object not all of it so we have had uh, annotations that were given by the by the microscopists as characteristics of the malaria parasite so it is able to perceive that take it in and over time it will now learn very complex features of that object in terms of color shape and all that once it has learned the holistic characteristics of these objects over time then that is now a fully trained model that every time you bring in now any new image without any annotation it is able to uh, respond and provide inference I hope I was able to break it down in the simplest ways we can relate to, but relate it to the way your our brains do work to perceive and detect certain objects around it. Then uh, there was a question on the quality of images. Again, I didn't take note of the presenter, I think because of uh, the volume, but what I noted out of the question was how do we take care of the quality of images given uh, the fact that we have different uh different phones well this is a samsung not an iphone and apparently we've not tried this on an iphone because we wanted to keep it as um as cheap as possible because we want to develop low-cost solutions for our context that notwithstanding there is a question of how do we uh get the quality of the image uh, that we capture through the phone and this the way we're able to take care of that is that while we were developing the adapter we had to sync it with the focal point of the eyepiece to align with that of the smartphone so if they are in sync we believe that whatever that comes from uh, the eyepiece of the microscope will be uh, gotten uh, onto the smartphone but again like you've noted that we have different variations of smartphones there is a version of a Samsung. There is a version of uh, there is a version of uh, techno phones, even in Android technology. Of course, there are different versions. And one of the solutions right now we are looking at is that we're creating a data set that is based on the different settings, so that we can be able now to standardize a model that is able to align with all the different variations of the environment that we're dealing with. And also to note that this is not only for the smartphones alone because we also have different variations of microscopes of course common to our setting is the olympus microscope but you've gone in different healthy facilities like Shurudu, there is another there are so many different sets of 
uh, microscopes. And then that brings in a different context and setting. And one of the questions that we're trying to uh, answer in the current research that we're undertaking is that can we be able to develop a standardized role collected using Samsung? How is that going to align uh, with images that were collected probably using a technophone? So those are some of the standardizations that I was talking about that we're looking forward to addressing. And once uh, those results are out, shall be glad to again share them. Uh, Rajab uh, uh, asked about how do we compare the model to... I think it was, why did we choose to compare here the model uh, first our CNN and SSD, given the fact that, we, of, of course, we have different uh, models or set of the art models. By the time this research was uh, undertaken, apparently then first our CNN was one, and we are guided by literature again to the choice of the models that we 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 and we 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 chose here. Uh, the choice of this was that first our CNN was good at performance, and we wanted to actually ascertain that if that resonates with the problem that we are undertaking and that we actually uh, reported back that yes, it provided better inference compared to its counterpart, the SSD model. And why the choice of the SSD is that this was one of the models that was uh, syncing very well for the mobile deployment. So we wanted to have, if I capture a, a, an image onto the eyepiece of the, onto the the smartphone, can I be able to capture and as well as seamlessly be able to uh, do the detection on the smartphone? And that was the choice for the SSD model. But of course, all these were uh, guided by the literature review uh, that we undertook then. Uh, currently, we have, of course, better performing models. And those are some of the things that we also want to investigate further to see now if what is current as the state of the art now is beating what was state of the art then. Uh, then there was a question on um, how did you connect uh, you? I didn't get this question very well, and I think it was from Rajab. I didn't get it well. How do I connect computer vision? I don't know. Because uh, in image processing, we are specifically trying to look at uh, the analysis of the image. And of course, here we are using a computer vision that was based on the RGB images. Uh, I don't know if that was the question, but I didn't capture it uh, very, very well. There was a question that came in from Talemwa from Barara University, and uh, he was asking about, uh, we have uh, we have uh, these models being data hungry, uh, but then uh, in our settings, we usually don't have huge data sets to be able to, uh, to consume the mod to, to to consume the models that we are proposing here. How were we able to which or which method can we be able to use to curate uh, this data set? Of course, for us it has been like a you know step by step way of improvements. Uh, we initially started with around a thousand images, but then again, when it comes to medical imaging, there should always be a collaboration with a medical facility, and then we have to go through all the requirements of uh of gathering this data and that means that you have to go through irb approvals those are the ethical uh guide guiding documents that you first have to acquire before you carry out any medical research to know that uh you working within the right guidelines uh for medical data handling um uh, so for us, those were some of the hint points that we looked at to have a collaboration with a healthy facility, uh, but as well as to be able to uh, get the IRB uh, approvals from the, either the Ministry of Health or any research ethical committee. Uh, it could be Mulago for our case, but any that gives the IRB approvals, you have to have such a collaborative uh, mindset around it if you to gather data set. Uh, but we also mentioned that it's not really very easy to get. And uh, yeah, those are the, some of the pushing points that we have to address to be able to push so that we can be able to generate uh, benchmarking data sets. Could be this for malaria, but then there are also other, of course, different disease challenges that may need data. 
And so one of the ways could be for us to have an understanding either with the government or with the different uh, healthy facilities that can be able to generate for us this data, but as well as to have a collaborative uh, mindset uh, with them to give us this data. We also have the data protection policies around in Uganda, and those are some of the guiding uh, documents that we do follow while we are generating these data sets, especially around health, given the fact that it's a very sensitive uh, domain. Uh, and lastly was a question on the cost of the phone. Yeah, the cost of the phone, and I think that came out clear when someone was highlighting that this is a smartphone. And I said, well, for us, we're looking at uh, the low cost uh, solutions using um, low cost smartphones. I don't know what could be cheaper than that as a screening uh, platform, but I believe now that they are very common on the market. They're very invasive for objective for, for image analysis. And that was what drove our uh, our our choice for the use of the mobile smartphones. Thank you for that. Okay, I uh, will use the remaining few minutes and I will just stop the share here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, doctor. Okay, so uh, here is uh, 
the CNN training and evaluation for um, what we call getting hands data to be able to run um, what I've been explaining. And one of the, for those who have interacted with, uh, I don't know whether you already had some trainings on, uh, for example, installing Python or using Python. And I believe that if we are coming from that ground, uh, one of the machine learning modules to look at is the scikit-learn. Uh, because this is a, a machine uh, learning model, especially for predictive uh, analytics. And since we are now looking at prediction of whether an image has parasites or whether an object of interest is a parasite or not uh, a parasite. So one of the things that we have to go through is to be able to have all the computer vision modules uh, installed. We have computer vision two, which is a CV2 that is used for computer vision. Uh, we also have scikit-learn that is a that's a machine learning module for predictive analytics. And specific to this, when we are looking at convolutional neural networks, is that uh, I, I don't want to overwrite this. Is that we are looking at by then we are using what we call lasagna model. And these are some of the things that you can be able to go online and install. Uh, not forgetting that you do have, uh, in this case, uh, any note where you can be able to run a notebook in, in any case. And I believe that in the Python uh, tutorial, you are able to uh, have an appreciation of how to install uh, some of these uh, packages. Uh, when you're running... Uh, a problem such as this, one of the things that you'd want to look at is if I have these images and I want, for example, to carry out a basic task such as, uh, and and I'll give the final of it, that I want to be able to detect parasites. I have a directory where I've kept all these models. Can I be able to, you know, how can I be able to now do the training of the images or training of the uh objects of interest to be able to do the detections so one of the things that we have to look at is what are the different modules that i, I do need to run a computer vision task such as this and then uh, what modules do i need to install for example if i'm running a cnn model uh it was very essential for us to carry to use apis that are already existing online and that's the beauty with python is that most of these models are already online and all you need is just to install them and then import them from where you've saved them uh, from. Um, so you have to now look at where you've saved the images. Uh, once you know where the directory, so we have to look, I'm not running this because uh, this was you, this was run on a, uh, a python python version which is not installed here but the idea is if i've stored images for example as many images of the parasites or, or the malaria thick blood smears that i want to analyze can i be able to call them so i need to be able to get the file where it is stored and using the we get you can be able to get um the folder where you have been able to uh, keep this data set. For example, I'd kept it and I'd kept it under Pasmodium phone camera dot zip. So you can be able to unzip it so that you can see uh, what is within uh, that directory. And once it is unzipped, then you can be able to now generate different folders. For us, what was important is we have an image folder or an image directory and then another directory with annotations on those images. So the idea is if we have images aligned with their different annotations, then we know what objects of interest we are pulling out. So whenever we make a directory data stroke images, I was making a directory to separate because this zipped folder came with both images with their respective annotations. So the idea was to separate them 
into different uh, directories and uh, to be able to look at that of course uh, for the images they usually come with a dot jpeg and then uh, these are all the different examples of images that we are dealing with here and this was to help us uh, to align to come up with both the images as well as uh, the annotations that speak against uh, the different images. So here I was just trying to visualize what we have put in the different folders by trying to call the different folders and with the with 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 the content that is within them. Uh, and now we want now to start building the model. So there was someone who asked, "What is a model?" While I try to explain it in a layman's language, but now we want to understand how are we going to describe the model. And um, remember, we have uh, the annotation folder. We also have the image folder. So then we want to characterize what we want the model to look like in terms of if it's to detect, uh, if it's to, to work on uh, the task that we have at hand. Um, so the idea was to first get the patches for example for our malaria image it had it was a very huge image but what was of interest to us as parasites we had to give it a patch size so at first we tried out a patch size of 50 by 50 but then we realized again to the different iterations of trainings that we had to undergo that was a bit huge so we had to downsize it again to 40 to 40 and then uh we were able to uh, have uh, the patch stride training. So the idea here was if we have a, 50, a 40 by 40, if you have a smaller image, that is even better. So you have to even further down sample it so that the model becomes lighter when it is training. How did we carry out the training? So we had to derive our data set which was of around a thousand one one thousand one hundred and eighty two images and we had to divide now that uh, folder image folder into train files and these were the ones that the model was going to train on then the validation files and again the test files now the test files will be the ones that come after the model has been validated and the idea is can we be able to give uh a proportional to split the entire image data set into smaller files uh, that can be uh, trained on, but as well as uh, tested on. So our 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 split was 0 0.5 for the train. Uh, the test was 0 0.5, and then uh, we had to put the validation set portion at uh, zero. So here for the training, and this is the step where we are now training the data. So for training the data, we're going to create patches. Remember, the create patches come from the patch size, again here from here, because this is now the opts folder, which is having uh, the categorization of all the characteristics of the images that we're looking at together with uh, the different uh, image processing uh, procedures that are going to go with it. So every time we call the opts, uh, the opts file, it is pulling out all this that involves uh, the image directory as well as the annotation directory so that we just oppose the image directory against uh, the annotations. And again, we do read the data to create patches. We had a different, uh, you see here, we call a different model, module that is to read data. And I don't know if I can be able to show you that. So you have to generate a module where you're creating the sets to generate uh, directories for image. I don't know whether you can see the read data dot py. Are you able to see that? And the idea here is to generate image files that are respect that, that are respectively going to be used for the train, test, 
and again if you have the validation files so the idea here is that you generating you reading the data so we have to generate a module for reading data we also have to generate a module for object detection and this is where now the model for doing the detection lies so if i can open that as well is that we have to generate a module that is uh, based on our machine learning modules which is the skyline to be able to generate the morphology of the objects of interest and the idea is here you're determining the detection prob probability threshold of what is based on what were the overlaps of the bounding boxes and once that lies within the detection pro pro probability threshold, then it will at detection probability threshold that you have defined through the detect module, then it will always read it as any other part of the image, which is now classified as the negative, uh, the negative patches. Because the idea here is that we want the model to be able to read files parasites rather positive patches because we said that the positive patches are those that are characterized with the morphology of the malaria parasite if we are now we have been able to now generate uh the parasites which are the positive patches and i think here you can see that here we are doing uh, we have the positive indices, but as well as we also generate the negative indices. The negative indices are those that are down here in the image that are that don't have any representation of the parasites. And then the positive indices are those that come with the parasites. The other thing we faced here was the fact that once we generated the positive patches, they were smaller in number compared to the negative patches. And in essence, if you look at an image such as this, you'd realize that we have very few examples of parasites vis-a-vis -vis the different patches that are going to be around every image. So if we are to just oppose that for a training, then there will be what you call class imbalance. And therefore, one of the things we had to undertake was to balance uh, the data set to increase the number of the positive patches while we reduce the number of and negative patches that was done through the augmentation procedure. Augmentation is a way of improving uh, class imbalances by improving a lower a class with lower numbers while uh, degrading that with more examples, so that we create a balance while we are doing we are carrying out uh, the the training. So once we did, we carried out the augmentation and that was basically to improve the data set. We now had to train the model. And by way of the model is that we now generating layers. We have the um, pooling layer, pollutional layer, and all that we had to generate uh, parameters. If I can speak to this is that uh, these pooling layers, all the layers that we see here are those that are generating the characteristics that are around the image, filtering them out, bringing them together while learning complex uh, features in the image. We had to do iterative ways of uh, improving the layers here because this was a custom, uh, a custom generated model. So it took us different uh, iterations around the epochs, which are the number of training uh, steps that we had to take uh, to be able to uh, come up with a very good performing model. Unlike the models now, which are already pre-trained and we can learn from them, uh, usually models that are developed from scratch are very, very ta taxing. And that's the reason why uh, pre-trained models have now come to be handy in improving uh, the way objective detection tasks are carried out. So once our model converged very well, we now had to use the model. 
So once this training is done and then you can see that we trained it for around 50 epochs, five, five, I think 50 epochs for this. Uh, once it converged and you can see that it had like up to 0 0.90, it began from 0 0.927, but it kept on improving. And the validation loss, as you can see, kept on reducing. Uh, and once we generated now that model, we had to uh, come up with an evaluation of it to see how it actually performs and where to do it is by the use of the AUC curves. The AUC is a trade-off of what the model has been tasked to do and what it was able to predict so that it gives us an insight of the performance of the detection that we are looking at. And in this, you can be able to see that it gave us a very good AUC of one, uh, whereas the precision recall was around 0 0.9. Uh, in terms of inference, we again wanted to see if what it was showing in the curves was coming out very nicely. We now had to uh, generate a new test image that had not undergone the training to look at the examples and then to be able to see what actually the detections are. So you can see that on the detection, this was predicted by 100%, and you can see that the AUC is at one. That means that the model was actually performing very well at detecting uh, the parasite on a completely uh, new test image. To just oppose that against the entire thick blood smear image in this example, we had to give the image, first of all, to the expert annotators to annotate uh, the parasite examples, which are in white. And then the model performance is as you can see. And indeed, it was even able to capture another parasite, which was not uh, annotated by the experts. So here, we were trying to now generate the model itself and be able to save it so that in later we can be able now to just use it. And this is where we do the pickle dump to store it somewhere so that anytime we want to use it on a new test image, we can be able to uh, generate it and use it without again going into the iterative processes of retraining uh, the model. Thank you very much. That is just a brief. I know I've gone beyond presentation has given us very valuable insights into the research possibilities of the field and thanks to your expertise we now recognize the, the immense potential uh, it holds. Thank you also for your detailed tutorial. We appreciate the efforts that you made to share your knowledge with us. Please let's appreciate the cameras. I think uh, we can take questions, Dr. Rose. Dr. Rose, are you still available for us? Yes, please. Available. Uh, we'll take uh, we'll the audience. So the we audience. shall take the first question. Five different people, and uh, preferably those who haven't asked. We shall prioritize those who haven't asked questions before. So, um, okay, there's a gentleman here. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for the presentation. 
I'm Henry Semakula from Isbat. Uh, my question is, uh, why didn't you pri uh, go for Vision Transformer over CNN? That's the first question. May we have the second one, please? Okay, now we shall take from anyone. Because I was first prioritizing those who hadn't asked before, but I think it's the same people who are asking. Dr. Lowe, thank you so much. Danson Karemwa from Bara University. Uh, Dr. Images are not numbers. So maybe you could give us light on how you labeled the images so that they can turn into numbers for prediction. Uh, maybe another part is uh, how did you pre-process pre your images for an accurate prediction? Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Thank you very much for this nice talk. I'm Lisette, an exchange student at Mercara University, and I am quite interested in what would be the ratio between infected images and the ones that are really healthy, and would it make a difference if it isn't um, catching up exactly on what you would uh, expect in the real world? So when you are, for example, doing 50-50? Is that all? Okay, uh, Dr. Rose, those are three questions. That's what we have from the audience. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for the questions. Um, The first question came in from a representative from ISBAT and was asking about uh, why was the choice on the use of, um, why did we choose to use CNN over vision transformers? Yeah, so um, the reason and that this that this was um uh, one of the classical examples that we first developed then and as you can see that here we are actually using nolan which is no longer one of those uh, set of the art but one of the inspiring things was that we wanted to generate a model from scratch especially and i know that whereas again um vision transformers are one of the fancy models right now for classification especially when you're looking at patch uh classification uh because it involves um uh having it these are already embedded and uh the embeddings are already added but for us one of the things that was the moving indicators for this research was to be able to how do we how are we able to generate a model from scratch and later again, when you read around the work that we've we've been able to do, we've now been able to use other more fancy and state-of-the-art models that are already even trained. So we do what we call uh, transfer learning and uh, learning on already pre-trained models. But by the time I was starting this research, some of the uh, starting parts of this research is that one of the things that we wanted to understand is how do we generate this model from scratch how do we develop it how do we improve it and that's why i told you in my presentation that one of the steps that we undertook was to be able to look at uh, different iterative mechanisms of improving the model and that again goes to answer one of the questions that i had from tarema of how we were able to do uh, the pre-processing of the images this was uh, iterative and like i told you that and again, that 
uh, goes to answer the last question that came in from, uh, I, I just didn't capture the name, but she was talking about the ratio of the parasitized patches and the unparasitized patches. And like I showed in the images, if you look at the ratio of the parasites vis-a-vis -vis the ratio of uh vis-a-vis -vis the ratio of the unparasitized parts of the image, you'd realize that there is a big proportion of the unparasitized against the parasitized options. So those are some of the pre-processing steps that again we had to undertake manually by improving. We kept dropping uh, the number of uh, negative patches while increasing or improving the number of the positive patches so that we have a balance uh, around the data set so that we don't bias it so much against the unparasitized because as we we're trying to do that, we had to run into a, a model that was either underfit or overfit. And uh, through the iterative mechanisms, we were again able to augment our data set to the different augmentation mechanisms that I've already told about uh, to improve mainly the data set and to be able to pre-process the image. Then the other question was how were we able to pre-process again to answer that on uh, pre-processing of the images for accurate prediction. Like I told you, once we had to look at, first of all, the object of interest, which was the parasite, while putting into consideration that we don't want to miss a detail on the parasite. So at first we had to look at a patch of around 50 by 50. And again, when we carried out the uh, training, we realized that of course, uh, this was a bigger size. So we again had to uh, down sample it so that we reduce it to the most smallest detail without any noise that comes in from any other part of the image that's not a parasite. So uh, these were some of the details and these are some of the pains that come when you're doing uh, training a model from scratch. But it was, it, was, it was rewarding because we got to understand all the nitty gritties that goes around the different layers of the model that goes around the different aspects and descriptions of what it means that, what it means if the data is limited or what it means if one example is low and what different scenarios are, are undertaken or under, are, are explained under these fancy pre-trained models that we are now using. So for us, it was a very good learning experience and a classical one, especially when someone is just learning, uh, training a model, because it gave us drills to understand and put an explanation to each of the results that we were getting. So it was just a walkover when we were just uh, trying to undertake the pre-trained model. And yeah, that was one of uh, the learnings that we came up with, especially when you're looking at uh, image imaging in for medical uh, practice. Yeah, thank you very much. Back to you, moderator. See. Uh... Please let's clap for Dr. Rosa again. And now, as you may have noticed, there was a, an adjustment in the program. So Dr. Ernest Mwebaze will come after lunch. So now it's time for lunch break. Uh, when we had the first break, uh, a member of the audience expressed concern that we hadn't prayed for the meal, but uh, <laughs> I was not sure in what denomination we should pray because I recognize that we have diverse beliefs, or beliefs or not beliefs. So, but uh, if it's a general consensus that we pray for the meal, then we can do so. Somebody may volunteer to pray. Do you have anyone who will volunteer to pray, especially the person who was? Uh, you may please come over and pray for the meal. You can come over very fast. So I am assuming general consensus for prayer. Okay, let's have ourselves a short prayer. 
Almighty Father, I want to thank you for this day so far. I want to thank you for the meal you are about to bring to us, Lord. We want you to be the one to bless it and breathe us who are going to take it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Thank you for the prayer. So we are going to proceed to the, to the same place that we had our tea break from. Okay. Uh, so we shall come back here in one hour. science. You can just Google Dr. Mwebaze's name. You will see the publications. So we are very fortunate to have him today here with us and to listen to his experience and insights. So without further delay, I invite you to lend your ears to Dr. Mwebaze as he guides us through our fourth tutorial, a tutorial on machine learning. Please join me in welcoming him with a round of applause. Okay, uh, yeah, good afternoon once again. So we, yeah, this is going to be a hard session. I, I saw the amount of, uh, of color people put on their plates was, uh, <laughs> was, was staggering. So it's going to be a staggering. <laughs> Lucky for me, I'm standing, so I can't, you know, it's, it's hard for me to, to fall asleep, but yeah. Okay, so I think what we are going to try and do is uh, it's going to be a two-part session. So I'm going to give some type of primer on machine learning and then uh, I'll have my colleagues Solomon and Joel come and give, uh, go through a, a notebook, a notebook uh, to try out some of the things I'll talk about and then part of that notebook has some exercise so that... Uh, Okay, 
So they've said I shouldn't talk about Kalo, that people ate only Matoke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to try. Okay, just a minute. I need to connect to Zoom, I think.
the number of organizations that mention artificial intelligence you know, in uh, the, the number of organizations in different countries that measure artificial intelligence and we see Uganda is somewhere here so you know there is a yeah you can't quite see it there but you know you have South Africa you can see from these colors South Africa Egypt Nigeria are sort of leading and we are somewhere in the middle with uh, Tanzania and Zimbabwe so we are not doing extremely well but uh, this is the state of things so there's a need that's why this DSA is important to get people talking about AI, to sort of start building organizations and startups. And that's why we want to do this training more and more. All right, so uh, what, what is AI? So I'll start from AI and then come down to machine learning. Um, so one, one definition is sort of this science of building agents or machines that act rationally. And rationally normally means, you know, when we get angry, you say that guy is not a rational thinker. He gets angry quickly, right? I mentioned here, Kalo, some people got angry. You know, they're, they're not rational. But anyway, so rationality has a bit... Um, all right, there you go. So rationality has a bit, uh, some idea of optimizing some sort of objective function, the best way you can, right? Uh, which is sort of the, the second thing. How do you optimize some sort of objective function? Uh, that's the other way of defining AI. Um, this is a bit abstract, but, you know, you can think of it as um, we normally assign a machine or a model, some type of goal. You want to diagnose malaria in a certain way, and you want to, you want to build some sort of machine that can do that the best way it can. Right? And so if you have some objective function, you want to sort of maximize that function. Um, and if you do it rationally, then you're doing it the best way you can. So one example is, for example, school, right? Many of your students, you go to, you go to university to study a course, and the idea is you, you have some sort of objective function you want to maximize. Some of them get the best degree possible, or some of you want to get the degree and earn the most amount of money. Or some of you choose a course where you can relax a lot, you know, there's not much assignments. Uh, I don't know. When we're in university, some were going to steal. So, you know, there are many things people go to university to do. Uh, but all those, you can think of them as objective functions different people have. And if you can do it the best way possible, imagine you could read really hard, you know, to try and you know, get the best degree you can, then that would sort of be um, maximizing that function. All right, so AI has this sort of component. Build a machine, a model, a software, assign some objective function and try and achieve that in a maximum way. But that's a bit more complicated. Normally, we just want to make computers do complicated things like uh, Dr. Nakasi was saying, you know, she wants to get some model that takes an image of a, a microscope, microscopic image, and then identify parasites there. Right? That's very complicated stuff. The stuff uh, Dr. Goodliver is doing here, take an image of a plant and identify disease. This is what we typically associate with uh, AI. So there are two ways to do it. One way is the, this, the knowledge-based way. Uh, so this this is what people used to do the first time AI was introduced. People did this. And now it takes on different forms, but people still do it. Uh, and this one, I think the, the easiest word was expert systems. If you ever did AI and they talked of expert systems, this is what they meant. Right? So I get, a, if I have a database, I get a doctor or a, an agriculturalist can go to the field and look at disease, I quiz him on everything he knows, you know. Okay, when, when, it's, when the plant leaf looks dark, what does that mean? I write it in some sort of database. When I find the plant is short, what does that mean? Right, so if I have a big knowledge base, then I can, I can do something incredible with that, right? I can do something complicated. I can build some system that goes such as the database, or the knowledge base in this case, and then predicts disease. That's one way. That's a very hard way. 
It's very hard to get all the knowledge. Right? Uh, so the easier way is called machine learning. Right? And machine learning, we extract information directly from historical data. Right? Uh, so if we can get all the images this expert has ever diagnosed, right? He goes to the field, he says this is sick, we take an image, sick. This one is healthy, we take an image, healthy. We go through all the gardens in, uh, in this area, then we'll have a big data set, and then we can use machine learning to learn um, the function or some underlying function that predicts disease. Okay. Are we there? Uh, any questions? So you can, since we, we ate a lot of food, you can ask questions anytime. If it was in the morning, we would not allow. Because there you're still hungry. So if you have any questions, please feel free. All right, so the, the short of it is machine learning is really a subset of AI that uh, mainly focuses on this idea of learning from historical data without being explicitly programmed, right? All in short, just learning patterns from data. You have a big data set of images, you learn a pattern of how disease can be predicted from these, these images. All right, so what do we do as Sandbad? Sandbad, we do AI for social good. So I thought I would mention, I would put that in a slide as well. Um, uh, and which is the reason why data science exists, the reason why we do many things. Because we want to do good, right? We are all here because we think we can influence the world positively by computer science, data science, right? hopefully. Um, so human beings have intelligence and they want to do good, right? This is a premise. And AI offers a way to amplify human intelligence, right? So it can amplify your intelligence, uh, and so you can do a lot of good, right? If you combine these two sentences, then you can do a lot of good and you can scale the amount of good you can do uh, by, by AI. So that's the good part of AI. The other part of AI we, we will not discuss. Um, and so in Africa particularly, that's why we call it Data Science Africa, because Africa is uniquely positioned to make use of AI, right? We have many, many problems which are good opportunities uh, that you can use AI to, to, to do a lot of good. Okay, that's the only thing I've mentioned on that. All right, so we dig a bit into machine learning. So you want to enable programs to, to learn and infer data or to learn patterns uh, from data without explicitly being programmed. This is machine learning. And there are many examples. I think the, the, when you use your phone, anytime you use your phone now, you're probably interacting with some type of machine learning algorithm, right? Some AI algorithm that was built. When you do search, when you take an image and it sort of draws a box around the face, uh, when you take an image and it automatically lights, uh, you know, adjusts the lights, all these things are sort of uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, which are implemented on your phone. Right? So many, many things we do have already this uh, AI and machine learning. And of course, we've seen many examples, and uh, you know, there are many examples here. This is a lot of work being done here, I think in Busitema and in Makere, the AI lab. So there are many, many projects around how do you diagnose disease in crops, right? Because of course, Uganda will rely on agriculture a lot. So this is a very nice contextual problem, right? Farmers need to identify disease. We can do that with a mobile phone, right? Uh, this is what Godliver was sort of talking about. Can you automate a malaria microscopy? And not only malaria, but TB, uh, ETC, right? So again, that's uh, a lot of AI stroke machine learning happening there. Uh, we are doing a lot of things on noise. So the project you'll be doing this afternoon will be on noise sensing. Uh, so we have, we, we have, a, I think we have a, a booth somewhere. Uh, 
uh, we'll show you some of the sensors we have and what we're doing with noise. We have Tiba there who will uh, be taking you through that. But the lab you'll do, the, 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 the programming you'll do will be based on, on noise. So this is environmental noise sensing. You want to understand the, the acoustic landscape of this place. This place is really, really quiet, really, right? But you can imagine uh, places like Macquarie University, you know, there could be a lot of noise around there. Noise is correlated with a lot of diseases, etc. So you want to be able to understand your noise environment. So this is what this project does. And we use machine learning to determine what types of noises are in the environment. All right, let's get to the fun part. How do we do machine learning? Um, <clears throat> All right, so the, the, the goal of machine learning, I, I don't know if this is clear, but you, you want to be able to build some type of uh, model. Someone asked what a model is. Um, so you can think of it in many ways, but it's sort of some function that relates some input data to some output data, right? So we have some data, some data X, uh, you want to predict Y, so X could be images, right? Images of crops, uh, and then Y is whether that image represents a disease or not, right? And so you want to build some type of uh, estimator or a model that can sort of predict um, a function of the input can relate to to your output, right? So if you have a certain leaf which has a yellow color, there's some function that takes that knowledge and then relates it to Y, which Y could be this is cassava mosaic disease or this is a healthy plant, right? So how do you build that model? So one, you choose some data uh, and from that data, you want to map raw data to feature vectors. So someone asked here, I think, you know, but images are not numbers. How do you take an image and make that into numbers that you can put into a, an algorithm? So this is, this is exactly what you do. So you, your U you is an image. You have some sort of function uh, that takes that image and generates numbers X which X is used to uh, train a model. I'm gonna explain these things a bit more. But anyway, you have some data. From the data, you extract features. Then you choose a model form. So a model form, a model family is, could be, okay, I want to use neural networks, which is the most common thing. That's one type of model form. It could be a linear algorithm. Yeah, linear regression. It could be a decision tree, you know, that I want to use a certain decision. So all those are different model forms. Uh, and you'll do that in the lab as well. And then you also choose some sort of parameters that you parameterize your model with. And this part here is what we call training. Uh, training, fine tuning, or whatever it is. Right, you want to identify parameters uh, in theta here that make this, um, that, that basically give you this, right? That you can map from input to output. Okay, we'll do this practically. So you have the first thing is really build a model, then the next is really to test and validate the model, right? You evaluate on unseen data, right? To assess the performance. Um, wh why do you need to do it on unseen data? What does this unseen data mean here? Sorry? Yes, sir. Exactly. Uh, you had a different. Mm -hmm. 
So you want to judge the performance. Thank you. Uh, Unseen data is the data set that you will train, uh, that, that, that you will expose the model to after you have trained it. So the testing data is the data that you use to train the model, but you don't know its performance. So you need a new data set that the model has not been exposed to, that you expose to it, then you can compare the performance of the unseen data, how it performs, vis-a-vis -vis what it had already been trained on. Thank you. You have a, 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 a that man has a rebuttal. Hey, this is a war. Nope, we have, nope, we have FDC here. You see, uh, this is what I, I, I understand. You know when you are formulating that model and the, uh, at a certain level, you have to split the data into training data and uh, testing data, of which uh, the training data will be used to train the model. Then the testing data, which is unseen, which is hidden, to be used to test the model and evaluate the model. And that's how you evaluate the model from what I've read. Okay. Mm -hmm. This fight is getting uh, complicated. Maybe the two should come here. And... <laughs> or we just vote. We just vote on who is the right one. And we go. Okay. All right. So we, we are going to we are going to cycle back to this this thing. Uh, just in two or more slides down. Uh, but that's that's an interesting argument to to have. You know, what is unseen data, what's test data, what's validation data, right? But basically, the idea here is you need to build some model and then you need to evaluate the model somehow, right? If you can't do that, then you do not know uh, whether it's doing what you want it to do. All right. Some more general things. Uh, so this idea of model, I think someone asked what a model is. So there are all manner of terms that we use for models. One is the, dif the distinction between supervised and unsupervised models. Um, I'm, no, I'm sure someone knows what the difference is here. Who knows? What, 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 what's, the super, what's the difference between supervised models and unsupervised models? Oh, we have someone online who knows. No, we will not allow the online people. They did not eat food here with us. <laughs> one, one people who ate food. Yes, sir. <laughs> so there's a target in the unsupervised, but it's not labeled. machine learning, and I've ever heard uh, about the concept of deep learning. So you help me to identify that too. So according to Ms. Pervised, uh, the, the output is labeled. Uh, for the unsupervised, uh, 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 yeah, the output is not labeled. Oh, we have a... In my opinion, the supervised model, it involves human experts, like giving it the input data and then trying to gauge its performance using the expected output. Then for the unsupervised model, you create the algorithm, then you expose it, okay, you expose it to data, but it keeps, and data and the output, then it keeps comparing for itself while making what? Making what? Uh, improving itself by itself. Did someone clap for me? 
Why did, why, why did someone clap for him? <laughs> uh, no, I was asking why. Okay. This is a very unsupervised class. <laughs> okay. For the supervised data, for the supervised model is whereby you give the inputs and maybe the corresponding outputs. For example, you tell him that when you, when the input is this, the output will be this, such that when it gets to some kind of input, it will know that the output will be this. It with the inputs and then the, the possible what? Results. And then for the unsupervised learning is whereby you give it the, the inputs and then you let it to find the, the possible results for that input. Uh -huh. I think we are getting somewhere. So, so far, this side has been answering. Three nil, guys. <laughs> Okay, my name is Geoffrey. I want to keep things simple. Uh, with the supervised model, which is the simplest, uh, it allows the, okay, basically you can make predictions with the supervised models. Then when it comes to unsupervised models, you're basically looking at hidden patterns and you're allowing the algorithm to discover the hidden patterns. That is the basics. But I don't want to go advanced, I will take it to go. Let me keep it simple. <laughs> okay, this side they say they're experts. They don't want to, yeah? Okay, but let's, let's go on, let's go on. Yeah? There's one person. Uh, I am Douglas Sonin from Eastbrook University. Uh, I think, uh, like he tried saying, uh, we should keep it simple. If you look at, uh, the two terms, supervised and unsupervised, they come from the type or the nature of the data set you use for training these modules, right? So if we talk about the supervised models, we're talking about models that are trained on labeled data set. And the unsupervised, we're talking about models that are trained on unlabeled data set, meaning we give them, for example, in, the, in a function of f of x equals y, we're only providing the x which is the independent, right? And then we're looking for the, the dependent, which is the output. So with, the, with these two terms, let's just, we can base our discussion at a basic level to make understanding easier by just uh, defining them depending on the data set that I use to train them. Thank you. Ah, that man. He said, let me keep things simple. Now the dependent, the independent. <laughs> That is not simple. <laughs> okay, let's let's uh, let's um, let's break it down. Okay, so yeah, so supervised learning uh, models, you know, predict something given some other things. So I think this, a lot of this is what um, has been said. Yeah, so part of it has to do with what with humans, as you said. So there is an element of labeling the the data that you have some data, you have some Y, and the Y is clearly marked. So if you have leaves, you can go and take images of plants, and then you need an expert to say, okay, this is cassava mosaic disease, this is healthy. I mean, if you train with this data, then it's uh, supervised, right? You have an expert who sort of looked at it and it's labeled. All right, and normally we, we call that, you know, a prediction model because you have a target that is very definite. You have Y that you know, and you're trying to predict Y. Uh, but it could also be a, a regression if you want to predict, a, a, okay, of a prediction model, you can have a regression or a classification, right? So a regression is if you have a real, um, a real number as the independent variable or the dependent variable y. So if your y is real, then you have a regression. If your y is, a, is from a finite set, then you have a classification, right? So if you, so a regression would be something like if I want to predict your BMI, for example, right? Which is sort of a number. Or if I want to predict, uh, 
I don't know, height, you want to predict. Someone had the example we had in the morning, predicting housing values. You know, that's a, a scalar number that changes. Classification is if you want to predict a disease, you know cassava has four diseases, four disease types, and you want to predict one of them. You want to classify um, the leaf, right? You want to put it in a class, a certain class. All right, um, unsupervised. Uh, yeah, so this is where uh, things get um, simple. This is how it's there, going to get simple. <laughs> right, so in, in unsupervised learning, you can have the same data, but it's not labeled. So imagine I had leaves. I went around taking images of leaves, right, of plants, right? So I don't have an expert to tell me this is disease, this is not, this is this type of disease. I just have a data set of leaves, right? Uh, so there you look at things like, okay, what are the clusters, what are the patterns? And typically, you know, we call it a data model. You want to model the data in some way, right? So what, what am I seeing in this data, right? It could be anything. Could be that part of the data is yellowish leaves, part of it is greenish leaves. So, you know, you, it's a model of the data, right? Or it could be that these leaves are shorter, these are taller. So anything, so anything you model out of that is sort of a model of the data you have, right? It's not typically a prediction, right? So it's not labeled, basically. Uh, but what you do with it is create a, a data model. There is a third category, which not necessarily third, but you have also things like point estimates or probability estimates. Right, so probability estimates, these, these, are, these are very interesting. So you could give probabilities as an output of your model, right? Uh, so it could be that of all these diseases, I can come up with a probability distribution or an estimate that says, okay, 90% I think it's this, but 65% I think it could be this disease, right? And if you're doing any sort of real life problem like uh, predicting disease uh, from images, you would expect this because some images, some leaves, you know, take on some disease, it could be two diseases on one leaf, etc. So a probabilistic estimate is, could also be a, a type of uh, output from a model, right? And typically the models you have Prediction models, you can convert it from just a prediction to a probabilistic estimate, right? Or you can leave it as a point estimate. Okay. Any questions? If there are no questions. All right. Let's, 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 um, let's, let's do an assignment. All right, so we want to predict what kind of models each of these tasks use, right? So I'm going to give you the task. Uh, so the first is predict tomorrow's rainfall, right? Given some data. What is that? What kind of, kind of model would that be? Be what? Rainfall model. It's supervised. Is it supervised? Okay, okay, what kind of supervised model is it if we agree supervised? Is it a, a kind of what kind of supervised model would this be? Logistic regression. Ah. These people, you said you won't keep things simple, but uh, yeah? the speed is high. You. All right, okay. But would it be a, a regression problem? Would it be a classification problem? Would it be a, it's a regression problem? Who, who agrees it's a regression problem? Noob. Hey. <laughs> yes.
what continuous variable? Predicts tomorrow's rainfall. Doctor, can I, I, I never wanted to say a lot, but. Uh, <laughs> you're forced, you're forced. I'm, I'm, I'm on it. Okay, honestly, I'm being forced to speak, but I, I want you to know that under supervised uh, model, there are four kind of, uh, all examples of tasks you can do. One of them, which is a logistic regression. Then the second one is decision trees. Then the third one is, uh, is support vector machine, which is actually an outdated thing. Then uh, we also have neural networks. Those are the ones which falls under uh, supervised learning. So now when you look at decision tree, are you, are you making a probability from that kind of a problem? Definitely not. Then when you go to the SVM, which is a support vector machine, definitely that doesn't fall there. Neural networks, uh, it doesn't fall there. So the problem goes into a logistic regression model. That's, that's why I decided to keep it simple. Because that is what uh, the supervised model does. I don't know whether but that's what I know 100% because supervised models covers that. I'm confident because I actually lecture uh, AI and, and ML at Macquarie. Do, do we have any other submission? So, 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 the, so the level you've gone is a bit it's a bit lower than the level we want to... It's a bit deeper. Deeper, not lower. Deeper. <laughs> All right. So... So you, you've gone a bit deeper to try and get the model form. What sort of model structure do we want to... What hypothesis of the model do we want to apply? Uh, but I think we, we, we want to be a bit higher. Uh, we want to just determine, is it a regression, is it a classification? Or a supervised, that's all. Oh. Leave meeting, let's leave the meeting. Leave the online guys to wonder what's going on. <laughs> all right. Uh, oh. can, can you click on this? I can't see my... Our people are okay. So, so I, I guess the the so the question predict tomorrow's rainfall, right? So it's a you can, you could you could take it in different ways. So you could take it as you say it. Maybe you want to predict the amount of tomorrow's rainfall, and then it will be a regression. You could also uh, try to predict will it rain tomorrow or not, right? In which case it becomes a a classification problem. Um, so they are, you know, it could be either, either or, right? It's not entirely clear. All right, so yeah, so that problem there, what about this one? Determine from a photo of a face if the user is who she says he is. Is this a supervised or unsupervised? Guys, you never get selfies sent to you. Gentlemen. What's happening? Well, what kind of model would this be? Supervised? Not supervised. It's, it's 
supervised. It's supervised. Who's speaking? Oh, yes, sir. I think a uh, uh, close example is when we, we are doing, uh, uh, when we're logging in, like uh, making your attendance uh, like at a university where you use biometric uh, thumb, right? So before you do that, the registrar takes your initial. And then when you come, you're just verifying using the initial input. So it's an example of that, which is definitely classification. Yeah, I, I guess I would also fall in there, right? Claims who she is. Uh, so you, there's some element that there's some reference label that you're comparing with, right? What about this? So what? So population. <laughs> the regression. It's a what? So it is unsupervised. Unsupervised. Is this unsupervised? What do you think? So you have, you want to estimate the probability of 10 possible diagnoses given some patient data and test results. Someone goes to the hospital.
No, this is not the last slide. Sorry. All right. So we we training and validation is to develop a model that performs well on new and seen data. Uh, and we we had a discussion about the new and seen. Normally three parts, actually, if you have a room for data. Uh, so you have the training data, which you have no argument about, and then you have this test for validation data, right? Which you use to evaluate uh, these models, right? So what's the difference between validation data and test data? I think this was the argument we were having. Anyone? Okay. So the so this uh, so typically if you have a large data set, you want to have three types of data. You have the training, the test, and the validation of the data. You want to understand how your algorithm or model generalizes, they call it generalizing to unseen data. And so ideally you take the test data and hide that test data, right? So someone said you don't expose it to your model. Uh, I think that's, the, that's what means unseen, that your model doesn't see the data at all, right? And what you'd be then be doing is using your training and validation data, right? So some, sometimes validation and tests get switched around. But the idea, the main idea is you want to train on one piece of data, you want to fine tune your parameters on your validation data, right? So you want to, you know, maybe you, you try, you know, logistic regression, you try SVM, you try whatever, and you're training, you you're, you're using your validation data to sort of score them, make sure things are working well, you tune whatever parameters you need, and then after you're satisfied that you've gotten the right model, right parameters, things are working well, then you, you try it on the test data. And the result of the test data is the, is the legitimate performance of your, of your model. You're going to do this in the lab, but uh, that's the idea. So if you don't, there's uh, uh, yeah, that, that's generally how you do it if you have a, a good data set. All right, and we can look at performance metrics on test training and tests. Uh, so you also want to measure your metrics on training and test data, right? So if your model performs really well on the training set, you know, it's doing really, really well, but performs poorly on the test set, then normally we call that overfitting, right? You have overfit the data. Hmm? If your model performs really well on the test data, it's likely to perform well on the new and seen data. Or it performs very well on the validation data. Ideally, that should be validation data. So you can overfit or underfit your model. Right? Uh, I think one good example of overfitting is if, you, if you're going to try a new dress for a function in December and you go and fit it now, go to a tailor, and they fit your fit the dress, right? Uh, I don't know if you've been to tailors, but if you go there and they fit your dress now, or your trouser, for a wedding in December, uh, normally the tailor will, will, uh, will, will sort of leave some space and say, you come back on, uh, one week before the wedding and we sort of put things together, right? If he measures it right now and he fits it properly, quote in quote, overfits, you know, it really fits it to your, then all the, you know, if we had this, you know, you've come to this workshop, you've eaten kalo, you know, your plate was, you've eaten matoke, tomorrow again, you know. by the time you get to December, you know, you've, uh, you've uh, expanded a bit. So, there, when it, you can think of that as a test set, when it gets to the function in December, whichever trouser you fit now will not work because you overfit the data to the model, right? So you want to be able to train such that it, uh, you don't overfit and don't underfit 
right? You don't want the tailor to, to you know, do a trouser that stops the side, right? Because then it will be useless. Um, okay. All right, so the, the rest of the things are really, I think we've talked about this. Uh, so you need to choose a model structure, and this is where I came in. Is it logistic regression? Is it SVM? Is it neural networks? Is it KNN? Is it, I mean, there are a million things you could choose from, yeah, given your data set. And then, given that, of course, you need to fine tune on some parameters. How do you tune parameters? Use this thing called a loss function. Uh, and this is what I was explaining here with the rainfall, right? Your loss, you know, you measure 23, you predicted 20, you measure 23. You need some function to tell you what is my loss. What is the error? Right? And so you can just subtract, then you square, then you, yeah, like a quadratic loss, they call it. And then the training is really a, uh, yeah, technical term is minimizing the error, basically. So you want to train and get model parameters that minimize that, uh, that error or the loss or the empirical risk. Okay, I'm done with all the technical things. Now the fun part. Um, oh, still not fun part. Okay, so, the, so now the data, data representations. So data, someone asked here, how do you take an image? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the difference between uh, parameters and hyperparameters? Guys, he's asking all of us. <laughs> Who can answer the man? What's the difference between hyperparameters and parameters? That's the question. Any answer? Any answer will do. We just need to satisfy the man. No? No answer? Oh, there's an answer. Ah, you've decided to move the microphone yourself. <laughs> no? Okay. All right, so parameters. So parameters are things, uh, normally things about your, your data, right? Um, or your model. The hyperparameters are sort of parameters on top of that. So parameters could be, hmm, that's a good example. So the, so, yeah, it's very hard to give one without an actual, so like a decision tree, right? So decision tree, you need to determine, for example, how many trees, you need to, how many splits, for example. I don't even know a decision, a decision uh, KNN. KNN, I don't know if they are. The value of K? Yeah, but what would be the hyperparameter there? So the, yeah, so like KNN, you know, you could have the number of neighbors you want to, to, you want to compare with, right? That could be the value K, the parameter. You want to train the value of K. You could have other parameters of the model that I can't think of now, maybe, Maybe the regularization, right? So you want to, yeah. Learning rate? Maybe the learning rate. Yeah, but. Okay, anyway, so, you, so when you're training a model, so there are parameters like the learning rate, which is a, a rate for doing optimization. So you're doing optimization. Uh, you could have, 
the loss. The loss could be a hyperparameter. Which loss do you choose? Uh, the regularization constants. What are those? Uh, what things do you tune there? So those could be hyperparameters. Then the learning rate, the number of runs, number of epochs could be parameters that you tune. Um, and so there are certain things that relate to the model the model family and some that relate to your training process. So is it right to say that uh, parameters are things inside uh, your model and uh, hyperparameters are out of your model? Yeah, so it depends on the model family, uh, the model function you're doing. Uh, but yeah, so when you're... They're more or less the same. You, you sort of have to tune both of them. But yeah, normally... Parameters tend to do with your, with your data, to. like how many epochs, how many runs, you know, how many, this kind of things, what's the learning rate. And then the others, the hyperparameters are things to do with the, like the regularization, how you're going to tune that, um, things to do with the model. Right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, but generally you want to, training means, uh, Training those parameters, right? Making sure you 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 learn those parameters, and you reduce the the loss function. Okay. All right. So so this this here is a, this is another important part of of machine learning. So data representation. So someone asked. How do you take an image and come up with numbers? So this is typically what you do. So you have, so machines, algorithms take vectors, right? They take numbers, numeric numbers, or real numbers, right? You don't put uh, an image. In this case, we are going to use sound files. Um, so you, you can't take audio data and directly feed it into your model. You need some way of representing that data in terms of uh, a vector. In, term, in terms of real numbers. And so this is called representation learning. Right? It's a key feature of machine learning. Right? So you take images, learn some sort of representation from them. It could be things like the number of edges, it could be the many ways people learn representations for them. It could be the color, it could be whatever. Right? And those are the ones you, you fit into a, a model. Uh, computer vision, I think, is the most common thing. Uh, maybe an image could, uh, could do some. I'm going to answer the question about, someone talked about deep learning and uh, machine learning. Uh, it sort of follows from this. So you could have local representation. So this is an, a cassava image. You could, you could take the image and calculate these interest key points. These sort of red things are places where the image is interesting, right? The edge of the leaf, where it's deformed, where it's decolorized. You could take these numbers and form a long vector. Alternatively, you could, uh, this is the same thing, you take points on the leaf that are interesting and then use that as your data in your machine learning algorithm. Or you could take something like color. So these are global features. So these are local, these are global. So global representation represents the whole image. What is the, what is the color distribution of different colors in this image? You get something like this, right? Uh, and these things, then you put them into a, a training algorithm and train your, your model. Um, and you can do multiple things with these things. Uh, so, so basically, if you're doing images, for example, the example I've given, take raw data, do what is called feature extraction. So that, that idea is to extract features of your image. Right? So local features or all um, global features, and then you train, right? So this extracting of features, the, the biggest problem with this method is that they have to be handcrafted features, right? So you have to know something about the domain, right? 
So if it's cassava, you have to sort of figure out that when a crop is diseased, then it deforms the, the leaf, it decolorizes the, it eats away the chlorophyll, so the, the leaf is more yellow than, than uh, green. Like you have to know these things about plant physiology in order to extract good features, right? And, uh, and this, this is problematic. This is sort of what we used to do in the old school. Uh, but where deep neural networks come in or uh, CNNs is that they can learn these representations uh, automatically, right? It's the basis of uh, a lot of the deep learning, like, no, actually a lot of uh, CNNs, right? That you can uh, use convolutions to learn local features and from local features you learn global features. Right. Um, so you, you you don't. Yeah, I think that's the slide. You can sort of learn these things automatically. Okay. So what, one big difference between, for example, CNNs and uh, or machine learning and deep learning, in some ways, is that you sort of get for free feature learning with deep uh, neural networks. All right. So. This is really the end of the presentation. I'm just going to give you uh, an idea of the data uh, we're going to use for the lab, and then we'll get into that. Yes, sir. Uh, when do you decide to use uh, machine learning and, uh, and deep learning? Yeah, so, so really, deep, deep learning is really a part of some subset of machine learning, right? You're still learning patterns. So where do you, when do you get to decide which is which? Uh, so for sure, you want to, for any problem, you want to start with the simplest thing, right? You want to start with the simplest hypothesis, right? So if you can solve it in Excel, solve it in Excel by doing something. Don't use machine learning. If you the next step would be to use machine learning, right? So if you have good historical data where you think you can extract patterns, then you can use something like, you know, good old-fashioned machine learning, SVMs, the decision tree. These are normally the first thing to try, right? Deep learning is good if the problem is slightly complex, right? So if you have a lot of images, we know for sure images, deep neural networks, because of the convolutional neural nets, they are particularly good with images. It's very hard to do it otherwise, unless the images are very clear, right? You want to compare a dog with a, with a wall, you know, then you, I mean, there is not much um, compl complexity there, right? And then from there, images or things like large language models, there now you have to go to deep neural networks. But if it's a simple, if the problem is clear, you have all the data, you know, it's numerical data, the first step is to try with uh, uh, some regular machine learning algorithm. If that doesn't work, then you, you try the more complicated uh, algorithms like neural networks. You had a question? Mm. Unsupervised and then reinforced reinforcement learning, but you didn't talk about it. Yeah. So. So yeah. So reinforcement learning is one other branch of uh, of uh, AI, another branch of machine learning that we um, that has to do with rewards. And, and punishments and things like that. You also have robotics, you know, uh, you have many other things. So generally, if, uh, generally we, hmm, why didn't I talk about it? So generally for Data Science Africa, because we try and do things related to our context, right? Things which uh, are common to the problems we have here, uh, there are many things in, that we skip in, uh, in, um, 
AI and machine learning, right? <clears throat> so there is a whole section of optimization, for example, control. Uh, that is very popular in, in AI and machine learning. But we don't touch on that here, right? So reinforcement learning as well, or robotics, you know, it's, uh, uh, you could think of ways you could use it here, but it's not normally the first thing we talk about, right? So this is not a whole complete course on everything machine learning, basically. So we try and bring things that could be relevant for you to go from here, go to your place, maybe there's a data set, uh, like here, maybe farmers, or you have a data set of radio data or things, and then you can process it easily. Uh, that's the, the short of it. Yes, sir. When do you know your model has not worked? What is the line after which you say, no, my model has not worked, let me try something else? When, when is that line? You guys must have trained some models. You probably know this. So, oh. do, so doctor, could it be right if I say I use uh, machine learning when I have structured data? and I use deep learning if my data is unstructured. No, no, no. Wait, are you answering this question? Let's first answer this question. How do you know when your model is not working and you have to pivot? To me, actually I'm Soke Robert uh, from Chambogo University. To me, his question is lacking something. Because if you are doing, let's say like research in education, and you intend to use maybe machine learning models, I think your research will scoop onto that without going beyond what you are supposed to do. Because if you are going to test everything, then that means you test everything in the world. That's according to what I have. Thank you. Yeah, any, anyone wants to attempt that? So it's a, so there's a, so there's a, there's a bit of a, it's a bit of a difference with this thing, right? So it's, uh, as I said, there are many, context is very important. This one thing you need to know when you're doing machine learning or any of this work, what's the context, right? So if you're doing a research, you know, then maybe you're trying to improve a certain model, you, you, you're going to use that. How you choose it is now where you come in. If you're actually doing things in, in practice, right, in production, you want to, you want to solve a problem. How do I solve this farmer's problem who has this specific challenge? Uh, then it depends, right? So if, even something as simple as, uh, as, uh, as disease detection, it sounds very simple. You go to a farmer, then they diagnose the crop, you take an image, it comes up with some diagnostics, you know? And it could be <clears throat> your performance metric is that it's 95% accurate, right? This could be your, so is this a good, good, is this good or is this bad? Should I move to something else? Right, so it depends. The, the correct answer is it depends. So, for example, cassava, there is a, a certain disease in cassava called cassava brown streak disease. The only solution for that uh, normally is to uproot the whole garden and burn it, right? So even if you're, model is 95% accurate, there's a 5% chance of error. So are you willing to stake your model over this guy's two acres of cassava that it sort of predicted this thing is wrong, right? Is 5% five, is 5 error sufficient, right? 
or, you, or something like cancer. Say you're predicting cancer in someone, and if the if thing is right, then they are going to go through chemotherapy, they have to fly them out, they have to... But your model is 97% accurate. You know, is, that, is that sufficient, or should I continue training more, getting more data? Right? So 3% chance of error. You know, is, it, is it going to have someone spend their money, they're going to get disease, by, you know, they're going to buy just a wrong diagnosis, right? So there are many parameters of when to switch. The easiest is if it's doing badly, you know, the error is, is really poor, it's near 50%, then you know it's guessing, you need to switch it up, right? If it's, there it's clear, but when, but it normally depends on the context of the problem. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Fahad. I'm from Islamic University in Uganda. Uh, my, you spoke of la, uh, large language models. And those of us who have used large language models, I'm very sure we are thrilled and excited at the possibilities that such models give us. For example, uh, ChatGPT, uh, Lambda from uh, Google to mention but a few. But you realize that these large language models uh, are generating, basically they do not think as we think, they simply infer. Now the question is, currently if you look at the trend, a lot of us humans, because these lang large language models are basing on the data that has been generated by humans, like the content, if you look at the poetry and all the other, and currently, I'm very sure if we have researchers here, there is a high probability that you have used either chat GPT or whatever tool to help you in writing or generating your paper. Now, my question or my fear is, what is going to happen when these large language models overproduce the data to surpass that that we have produced, yet they are using the same data to learn? Aren't we going to end up in a dreadlock or not? Like, I'm just thinking out loud. How can, you, how can we ensure that they keep planning? Because as, because as you realize that people are continuously using these models to generate data, and there is going to reach a certain threshold where all the data is generated by uh, these large language models, yet they don't think. Now my question is, should we worry? Thank you. That's a classification supervised problem. Should we worry? Yes, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, you can't stop reggae, as they say. So these things are coming, they're here to stay. So. Should you worry? Should you worry here in Africa? Should you worry here in Busitema? You know? I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure you should be too worried about them. But of course you should be a bit apprehensive. But these things are, I think they're going to cause more good for us than, than bad, you know? This is my, it's, I mean, it's the same fear you people had with ICT, you know, the Millennium Bug. I don't know if some of you were born People were worried ICT, the Millennium Bug is going to take over, you know, it's going to crash everything. Well, ICT is going to destroy things, but it came and we are here. So I wouldn't worry too much. Um, I, would, I, would, I would learn how to use them. This is what I would do, right? So you guys who are, make sure you learn how to prompt these, these large language models or to fine tune them or train them. This would be a skill. This is going to be your skill. So programming may be outdated. Mm. Can I can I respond to you? I think I have picked I've picked your question. Yeah. So uh, basically with uh, ChatGPT. I don't know whether you attended the conference, which was about, uh, it, it, I think it was two weeks ago, about these language models. You, 
one thing that they follow a standard and they are trying to standardize all the data. You cannot come today and say that, uh, okay, let's just keep it simple. Like maybe what is AI? And we know there's a standard definitions of what is AI. You get it? So that means the model is trying to generate for you data based on the standard definitions of AI. And one of the things that honestly I agree with Dr. N. Mwebasa is that uh, when you look at these tools that are coming up, they're actually not coming to replace you. They're, they're actually coming to allow you improve on your workforce. If you maybe you're writing a program and this, the source code of how to think, it's the same throughout. Normally we follow some standards, even when you're writing your code. That means it just helps you to give you an idea. The only thing which you should apply as a human, you should be in control of the information that, you, that is being generated. That, that's the most important thing. That is it going to replace you? No, it's not going to replace you. But you need to be in control of the data because it's, it's literally interacting with large volume of data. But it follows the standard. I think, I think that answers you. Then I also want to respond to this. Fight, Let me fight, fight, clarify. Fight. The issue is not that whether I fear training the models using the existing data that we generated as humans. We think. The tools don't think. Right now as I speak, the data set that's, that has been given to you by the, the gener uh, generative model, right? So if you validate that that's the right response, it'll store that, like for a case of chat GTP, it stores that and validates it as the correct form of knowledge. Now, it's your responsibility. If you are agreeing to wrong facts being generated with this, you're validating because you're excited to use these tools, then the responsibility to worry is on you. Secondly, now, when you do not validate such responses from such models, they are discarded. They are only given to you. So if you put the wrong fact into your research work, making your research work wrong, and then if you publish such, and then other models take it as their input, then still the responsibility of, make, of producing wrong information is still on you. So I would tell you not to worry so much about the data they produce, but about your responsibility in the production of such knowledge. Thank you. Okay. 
Great. So we are all to worry. Let's, let's be very worried uh, about the data. Yeah, that's that's the, the theme of the thing. But we're going to continue this discussion tomorrow. Uh, so now I want to hand over to Solomon. Uh, Solomon is a, is a PhD student, but also an engineer with Sunbird and with the AI lab in Makere. So he was going to take you through uh, a, a lab, basically, that goes through the things we've been talking about. Yeah, let's welcome Solomon. Let's clap Hello. for Solomon. Excuse me. Hello, excuse me. Uh, it's not actually a question. Uh, I was trying to compliment on what they're trying to explain. Um, yes, it is true. There is that probability that machines will start training themselves on actually data they have generated. But also you cannot eliminate the fact that it is development of Web3 technologies. And if you, tr you try to be keen that large language models are actually being developed by companies that are holding large data sets. But if you try to look at uh, the move behind Web3 technologies, we are trying to decentralize data. We don't want some kind of company to have a centralized control over a large volume of data. So if, you, if for example, I can give you uh, the case of, of blockchain. If you try to see mining of blockchains or bitcoins and what what, it's done by different computers located in different places. So it's very hard to centralize that kind of data. So you should look ahead. Such technologies are going to limit centralized large amounts of data for you to train such models. So the models that we're expecting to actually have to affect us in future are actually the transformers we're trying to train in this current moment. But as time progresses, we won't be having this data to train these models because of the decentralization of that information. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Uh, we should all go to the website, so if you go to datascience.org, um, I don't know if you can see this properly. Is it clear to you? I want you to go and access the notebook that you see here, so go and download it. Are we together? Let's get out our laptops and... Do, do a bit of work. We want you to go when at least you've trained a model um, from today's sessions. So if you could please um, take out your laptops so that we get our hands a bit dirty. I want to see laptops being uh, opened <laughs> so that we move on. It won't take long, uh, so please get, get out your laptops. I, um, I have colleagues that will be moving around to make sure that you are all set. So it won't be complicated for you to follow and do a bit of model training. Are we together? Have we accessed the notebook or? because I don't want it to be like a normal presentation where you just follow the code, but I want you to uh, code along. On the website, uh, on the program, just go all the way to the last session, and then 
click on the um, notebook. Who is with me? By show of hands. Who is? Those are only two people out of the entire, okay, four people. Internet. Uh, let's get other people connected so that we can begin. Uh, who is with me? I want to see people that have opened the notebook. Again, by show of hands, who is uh, following? I need more hands, I need more hands. Uh huh. And if you need help, just raise your hand, then someone will come and sort you out. You need, you need help? There's someone here that needs help. If you need help, uh, raise your hand, then someone will come and uh, sort you out. Okay. Yes. Uh, Who needs help? Are we all good? Are we good? To the website. Perfect. So, uh, before we get there, okay. let me just go back to that. Okay, go to datascience.org. And then you go to uh, should go to events. Just do slash slash DSA DSA Uganda like this one here and then slash events. Oh, or you can go to programs. Okay, so if you go to... Hmm? Are we following? Uh, then you can go to view details, and then the notebook will be here. Okay, uh, who has the notebook open? Again, who has the notebook already opened up? Okay, I need more hands. Any more hands? All right. Okay. I need your attention. We need to continue. So if you have the notebook open, I want you to go to file and save a copy to your drive. Are we together? Save a copy to your drive and give it a name that you, uh, you desire. So that, because you cannot edit the one that I've just shared, um, so your copy should be 
something like this, copy of uh, DSA, urban noise classifier, and this should be saved on your drive. Are we together? All right. Um, so this means that what you have now is an editable version that you can keep for yourself and practice at a later time. Um, so we begin the tutorial. So Anissa briefed you on um, the noise data that we collected. Uh, maybe if I show something small here. Uh, maybe not. Okay, so we collected noise across different cities, um, include, including Kampala and Entebbe. So what happened that we had different people that had phones that would go out and collect um, noise from the different uh, parts of the city. And this data came with an audio file and also a label that specifies which, which, what kind of noise that particular point had. If I show just one, Uh, so, like you see here, you have um, the noise measurement, you have the, um, and you have the category of the noise that was collected. So, for this particular case, the noise source was other. So, we had different categories of noise that was being collected, and we're going to be using this data to train our model to be able to classify between the different noise classes that we had. Um, I'm assuming that you are in your notebook that you've uh, created a copy for. What I want us to do is to begin with importing the different libraries that we're going to be using in the training. So I need you to run, to run the first cell of the notebook. It has different libraries that we're going to be using, like NumPy, to make sure that our data is formatted in a way that can be taken by the, the model that we're going to be training. We have pandas treating the data. And then, of course, have, um, we have scikit-learn to be able to uh, select the models that we're going to be training on. Um, so has this completed for you? Have you able, are you able to run the first cell? Perfect. The next part of that, the, um, the notebook is uh, extracting features. So we're going to be using MFFC, MFCC, which basically tries to mimic the way we perceive audio. Like when you hear the sound coming from maybe a radio or someone talking. So in machine learning, we use this to be able to extract features that so kind of represent the way uh, you would hear the sound coming in as a person. Make sense? So. In Python, we defined a method by using def, uh, then the name of the function. So this name could be anything that you, you so desire. And then the audio path. This will be taking in the training data that will be passing to the model. And then the um, NMFCC would be the number of um, coefficients that you want to train with. Um, yes, yeah, so we shall load the data, and then sampling route will be uh, taken as none for now. And then here we specify, of course, the audio. And then this should be around 44.1 uh, kilohertz. And then, of course, the number of uh, coefficients that we want to play with. So is this method clear to everyone? Because we're going to be using it to extract, extract the coefficients that we'll be loading to the model to do that actual training. Are we OK? Is it clear? Awesome. So it could be other features, because in the assignment that you have, you'd be extracting other features that are not necessarily um, MFCC. Make sense? All right, so go ahead and run this cell as well to make sure that you have the method defined. Are we all in the second cell? Is it running? It's running. I need some feedback. All right. OK, uh, next step is to uh, load the data into a working environment. So we mount the drive uh, because we would want to, um, to make sure that 
we can access the data from our Google Drive or wherever the data has been stored. And then it will ask you for some permissions to allow it to mount to your, uh, to your Google Drive. Uh, it's taking a bit of time. Okay, it has mounted. So that means I can access all folders that are within my drive. Is this okay? This cell here, is it okay? Have you run it? Awesome. So the next thing is the... So the data that we had, had um, numerical uh, values. Um, so we try to match a given number to a category that you want to um, label it with. So these are the class names that we want to train on. Uh, there were about, I think, 20 classes. So run that as well. We are good. Yes? Are we there? Perfect. Okay. The next thing is to generate the, um, make sure that we have, um, okay, this function, what it helps you to do is to make sure that for whatever sample that you have of the data set, we have a given um, label attached to it. Um, so we run that as well. And then the next part now is to make sure that we have the data downloaded onto our local, onto our drive. So you can change a few things. So this is in my drive, a folder called new is where I want the data to be stored. So that means when I go to my drive, there should be a folder called, and at this point there's no folder called new, sorry. Let's first go up to um, this link here is a, is a public link that has, that links to the zipped file of the entire data set. Makes sense? So we have, um, we have a folder of all the noise classes that we zipped and then generated a, a public link that you can all access. And then we want to extract the contents of the zipped file into a folder called new on our drive. Are we together? Um, and then after that, we want to be able to download, okay, we want to download the data and then do something with it. But because I have something already in the folder called new, I'll, uh, I'll label that as two. So when I download the data set, it's about 289 MBs, and it should, it, when you go to this folder here, there is a folder called downloaded.zip. Are we together? Do we have this in our folder under the collab? Yes? All right. So that means we have downloaded the, the data onto our, into our notebook, but then you want to extract it in a place that you can access it at a later time. So what we do, we, um, so depending on where you want to extract the data, you can define, because you've already mounted your drive, you understand? The drive is already mounted, so it should be uh, content slash drive my drive, and then the name of the folder where you want to put the extracted files. All right. Uh, are we good? So um, the next cell should be allowing you to extract the contents of the download download.zip into that location where you want to keep the files. Make sense? Are we extracting? What errors? Access. Do 
No, the, the folder, this folder should be to uh, their, look, their drive. Okay, so after unzipping, if I go to my drive, I expect to find there a folder called new to. You see this? And when I open it, I find there the, the actual noise data set that I want to work with. Is that okay? Who, are, who, who is with me? Who has reached this step? Awesome. This side, what stage are you at? Yes? Connecting? You should connect. Make sure you connect. Give it permissions. Okay, so because we have to go, uh, I need to conclude within like uh, 10 minutes. So let me, for those that won't be able to uh, follow, we shall be around uh, after and tomorrow so we can catch up. Okay, so after doing that, we need to load the data um, to be able to use it for the machine learning task. Uh, so, okay, so we need to, this is new too, and um, so we have the data that we have um, loaded uh, onto our Google Drive. So this next thing is extracting features and creating a feature matrix. Remember, already we defined a method to help us extract the coefficients from the data set. Uh, which was extract MFCC. So we passed in the file name, which would be the individual audio files that we have in our data set from each of the subfolders, and then the category, which will be specifying the, the category of the, of the noise that we have from up here. So the category would be cow track, boda boda, or any other thing that we have specified. And then these lists here, one will be containing the features that have been extracted, or the coefficients, and then Y would be for the, for the labels that have been assigned. Are we together? Hmm? Okay, so let's run that. Uh, when we run that, we generate, the last step here is to make sure that we, um, we put this in a format that can be understood by the model. So that's why we use NumPy, to put them into NumPy arrays uh, that we can use. Now this is the long part of the tutorial. It takes maybe about uh, five minutes to, because going through all the files that we downloaded to make sure that it can, it can extract all the coefficients and the labels for us to use. Um, all right, it's taking a few. Should be done in the next. Uh -huh. Are we together? Yes? You should be extracting. So mine is done in less than a minute. So now we can do our, our training. And in the tutorial, in the, in the previous presentation, you are, you, we learned about the training set, the testing set. So this is where all, all that comes in, the splitting of the data set into the, the different um, sets to use. And then you have your ship there. So we're going to train a random forest classifier because we want to classify the different noise, um, noise uh, audio files into the given, into the correct uh, classes. So we fit the model, which is basically uh, training it. So it's done, and then we can um, we we can predict on the test set, and then you see we get an accuracy of, uh, accuracy of uh, 0 0.51, and then you have the different uh, scores for each of the the classes that have in your data set. Uh, but then. To evaluate the model further, we can, we can um, save the model that we've trained uh, to somewhere within our directory, and then um, be able to, to load it. I think I already had something there. Let me just put the new. 
So I'm saving the module somewhere where I can. Okay, let me just load what I already have. I don't know why this. Okay. Okay, so uh, the model has been saved to that directory. Now, when I want to to get it out and uh, do some inference on it, I will uh, I will load it here. And then you have, again, you have um, a shared link to uh, to some files that you can use to test to test the uh, to test the what the model that you've trained. Um, let me see. So this is a public link that goes to a folder that. Um, that has that has some test files again, like what we did up. You'll be able to to download the the test images and then extract them to um, a folder on your drive, and then use some of those for inference. So let me just yes, serving the trained model. Okay. What error do you get? Okay, so so you can you can create Is that what you're saying? Uh, creating a So, uh, who has managed to save the model? So, you can stand up and help those that haven't figured it out. By show of hands, who wants to save the model? Please go around and help those that haven't been able to save. Go around and help. Does that make sense? So what you do, um, when you're saving the model at this point here, remove everything and remain with only the name of the file, then that, that, that file, that model will be saved within your, within your directory here on the notebook. Make sense? Yeah. yeah, so when you do this, it means that um, your model will be saved in this directory here. So it will appear somewhere down here with whatever name of the file that you give it. Okay, uh, who has managed to do that? Do you have a model saved? Awesome. So now what I, what I want you to do is to go ahead and, um, and load your model. Again, make sure that you delete all this because already the model is within uh, your working directory. And then you should be able to um, download a few files and then uh, 
and do some inference on them. So an example is that we have this new audio file here. And then, um, so when I play it, okay. you, you can't hear anything. But basically, uh, I wanted to be able to display it, play it, and then we do some inference on it and see what label it predicts. So this was a Boda Boda motorcycle. OK, who has managed to uh, download the test data? Who has managed to download the test data? from the, this point here. Have we managed to download the test data? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Uh, have we extracted it in a location that we want? Go ahead and extract it to a location that you want. And then, um, after that, you, you can do inference uh, on any of the files that you want to test with. Yes, I think uh, that's the end of the tutorial. We're out of time. But we'll be around. Uh, Joel's at the back, and we're here tomorrow as well. So feel free to come and uh, consult. Yes? All right. Have a good evening. Interactive session. Uh, all questions have been handled during the presentations and the tutorial. Uh, we've come to a close of an enriching and insightful day one of this workshop. Mm, all good things come to an end, right? Would have wished to go on and on, but unfortunately the day has come to an end. I want to express my appreciation to each one of you for the discussions, the presentations, the interactions that have been very exceptional. Uh, We've embarked on a journey of learning and discovery of data science, and we've had a privilege. Uh, we've had a privilege of learning from very distinguished experts today, and I'm sure you agree that their insights have been very valuable. So as we head into the evening, I encourage us to reflect on what we've learned today and to continue connecting and interacting with our fellow participants that are here. Thank you once again for your active participation and your commitment towards advancing the field of data science. So we will reconvene again tomorrow for day two of the workshop. The vans are waiting outside uh, to take us back to our hotels immediately after we exit this, uh, this conference hall. I wish you a very pleasant evening and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for day two. Um, So I let us hear from the transport officer. Hello, good evening, everyone.